folks, it's me. Today, I have decided that, you know what, maybe I should make like a little try out, you know, doing a little reading vlog. And I thought, hey, I'm trying to read the Red Queen series by the end of the year. So maybe I should vlog myself doing that. That could be fun, have some opinions, why not? We'll see how it goes. Red Queen, I read this book last year. I started getting back into reading like fully and I saw the title and it like kind of like bidding and I was like, oh, maybe I should read that. So I read it last year. And then after reading the first book, I kind of just like moved on to more reads because I didn't own the rest of the series. And then I recently was like, hmm, I should decide if I want to continue on with that series. And I really don't, remember enough to really make a decision on Miss Victoria Aviard's book series. I decided to reread the first book and I did that last month and I was like, you know what? I'm curious enough to continue. I thought about just like reading it again so I can like binge the whole series. You know, maybe I will do that. Cause like, you know, I read this a month ago and wasn't really planning like at that point I didn't know I was going to be doing a, a booktube thing so I didn't really take any notes or make any like detailed thoughts about specific things in it. I kind of just had like an overall opinion. So maybe what I will do is read the first book yet again for the third time. I mean I bought it so I should use it, right? And then I have all of the other books on my iPad from Libby. As much as I was curious enough to continue the series, I was not curious enough in my enjoyment of the rest of the books to purchase them. I can't just be buying things I think I might not be loving. I will read this yet again so I can give you some thoughts on it in between and then I'll be reading the other three in the series. Do I even know what the other three in the th series are called right now? The second one's Glass Sword. I know that. The other two, they're, it's escaping me. I guess I'll know the titles when, when I read them. As you can tell, I'm really highly dedicated. I am currently in this phase where I'm reading like YA from when I was like YA age. So this came out in 2015, which was when I was 17, 18. And I think if I read this when I was 17, 18, I probably would have liked it more than when I read it at like 24. But it doesn't mean I can't have a fun time. This is what we're gonna be doing. I was gonna say today, but like I'm not reading four books today. It's already nighttime. In this video, this is what we'll be doing. We're gonna be binging them all in a row and getting opinions for the whole series from me. So stay tuned. Yeah, yeah. Hello, good morning. I'm making my breakfast and I'm realizing that perhaps I should tell you what the book is about or something. Mm -hmm. Perhaps. Might be important. I'm about 80 something pages into the first book again, which is kind of the basic premise kind of wraps up at this point. So in this we are following Mare, who is red. And in this world, they live in the country of Norta. There are red, and silvers and basically what distinguishes them is the color of their blood and the silvers are the elite and the superior and the rich and the royal because they have superpowers. The red are just like normal ass people so naturally they're treated like shit. Makes sense. We start off, Mare finds out from her friend Kilorn that his mentor in this fisherman business is dead all of a sudden, which means his apprenticeship is over. He's gonna be conscripted because he's 18. And so she's all like, we'll save you. Cause she's also gonna be conscripted because she doesn't have a job. And if you don't have a job, you're just sent to the war. That's been going on for like, I think they say centuries, like multiple, maybe just one century. I don't know, basically forever. The war is just a constant. <laughs> that that is happening between Norata and the Lakelands. She's like, we're gonna we're gonna save you, Killorn. Apparently she didn't ever think about saving herself. She had just accepted her reality that she was gonna go to war and like die or something, like her three older brothers already are. Um, they're alive. They're just at war, but that was her thought. She's like, I'm just gonna go to war. And my younger sister Jiza is amazing at embroidery, so she's gonna have a job and she'll get the money for our family. She goes to the smugglers because she 
thieves all the time because that's the only thing she's good at. And she's like, hey, can you smuggle me and Killorn? Because now I'm also going to run away from conscription. This guy, his name is Will Whistle, who is just in a wagon. But this must be a really big wagon because they have like, they have like a city area inside this wagon. Like he's probably sitting in a chair and then there's like her and then also another person. The other, this other person is Farley and she's part of the Scarlet Guard. She's like, if you get us 2,000 crowns, which is the money, or whatever is worth 2,000 crowns, we'll smuggle you. And then Mary's like, mm, damn, that's a big ass amount of money. How am I gonna get that? So she like ropes in the little Jesus. She's like, we have to go to the, to the fancy Somerton village where all of the silvers are so we can, st I can steal this money and save Killorn. And Jesus like, Okay. I'm now just realizing that when I say Jesus, it's sounding like Jesus, and that's a little strange. Doing this while making breakfast was a mistake. I'm just pointing that out. So. Calm your business. Pause. I can't have my egg overboiling. So they go to Summerton, and she's all like, I'm gonna steal. I get this money because the silvers are so rich. There's just so much money here for, for me to be had. Before she even gets a chance to steal anything, there's a terrorist attack in the capital of, I want to call it Archeon. I don't know if that's the correct pronunciation, but that's what we're, that's what's been happening in my head. There's a terrorist attack. Really poor timing for Mayor there that she's currently in this silver town while this happens. So like a riot breaks out because everybody's mad because the Scarlet Guard has claimed the terrorist attack and all the silvers are like, mm, time for me to kill every red I see. Time to beat them the hell up because I'm mad. While they're like running away because she finds Jiza again and then Jiza because she's like, they didn't steal anything, Killorn's gonna die. She like tries to pickpocket this guy, gets caught and then her hand gets broken by a guard because you're not supposed to steal. So now her embroidery career is over. And Mare being really upset, she's like, this is all my fault. This wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for me. She's all like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run away from my family. I can't face them tonight. And she's like, let me go steal some more stuff from people outside of this bar, cavern, whatever. So she's stealing and then she gets caught by this guy who's like, hella handsome and he's all like you're a thief and she's like uh duh and then he's like here just take this silver crown and she's like this is a hell of a lot of freaking money why and he's all like you need it more than i do and then she's all you're kind of weird and then ends up like spilling her heart out to this guy and he's all like i'm sorry that sucks and then she just like goes home okay so then the next day she gets like woken up by like all this banging and screaming or whatever on their door and she's like what is happening i guess they're not screaming there's banging so she goes downstairs and it's like security and she's like mm, we've already had two searches this year what's up with this and they're like you've been summoned and she's like me what the heck summoned to summerton how cute and turns out that it's because she has a job now and she as a servant for the silvers at, at Summerton in the palace and she's like oh my god that guy cow that I tried to steal from but then gave me money he must have got me a job because he said he had a good job and that's why he has money how kind and then so naturally of course this is the day that also Queen's trial is happening so like every silver is freaking there because they want to show off their daughters to be like the next one to be picked to marry the prince so that she'll be queen you know it makes sense because princes become king blah -de blah -de blah she's there all of these like silver girls come out into this arena that's like covered by an electrical shield and they're like doing all this stuff with their powers and they're like destroying things because they're like super strong or they can make trees grow and they can control water and all this stuff and then like Evangeline comes out and she's all like dressed in like this like leather bodysuit looking real badass and she can like control metal so she's like moving shit around and then she's like I'm gonna move all the arena and then a mayor of course happens to be in this box of royals that she's currently serving. Basically she falls onto the electrical shield and she's all like mm, 
I'm dead was a nice life. Actually, it wasn't. But then she's not dead. And she, like, falls in. And then Evangeline is like... Because she's supposed to, she's supposed to be fried. Like, gone. But she's not. And then Evangeline's all mad. She, like, throws metal at her. And then Mayor's all like, eh! But then she doesn't get killed. And she's like, what? And it's because, like, electricity is shot out of her hand and like almost hit Evangeline and then she's like oh damn 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 so then she starts running she's running 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 she gets captured we know she gets captured turns out okay she gets placed before the queen who before this has like looked into her mind and has seen everything about her because that's her superpower and they're like everybody saw you so we can't kill you because all of these silvers are gonna ask questions about why a red person has superpowers. So what's gonna happen is you're gonna marry Maiden, the second prince that nobody cares about, okay? And you're gonna be a princess, we're gonna give you a new name, and we're gonna pretend like you're a long lost silver person, and that's how it goes. So now Mare has to go and pretend she's a princess. Was this like way too detailed? Yes. Do I care? No, because I'm a storyteller. This is what we're here for. Basically it's been like, three days and a lot has happened my questions so far have been mostly like there's certain things in the world they're not huge details that are really important so it's really easy to look over them and just kind of move on and accept it for what it is but I didn't do that I was thinking and the biggest one is the fact that there's school and this is this is a big thing for me that I don't get so if there is school and the Reds are going to school, and Mare is in school, and she's 17, and Jesus is not in school because she's an apprentice for the embroidery person. So then, how, how is school decided? Like, why is there school if we know that when everybody turns 18, they're going to be sent to the war unless they already have a job, and they only get jobs if they have, like, apprenticeships, apparently? That seems to be how it works. It doesn't, or you're a servant. That seems like the other job. So like, what, what's the point of school? Why are we in school? Also, if school's happening, why can't her parents read? Did school only start for this generation? Did school not exist before then? Because also, how can you go to school and not read anything? Because that seems pointless. Then also, apparently at school, they learned about like, the old gods, yet there doesn't seem to be any religion in this world. They also talk about myths, which again is never mentioned. Like, it doesn't seem to be a part of this world, this like mythology or religion. And then also when she's like being told she has to pretend she's a princess, they like mention like a fairy tale. So it's like, so are there also fairy tales in this world? Because it doesn't seem like there actually is any of that. So I'm confused what's going on there again why why are reds being sent to school if they're all just being sent to die also if everybody because it, it's not just men okay who are being sent to war then like why is her mom at home like shouldn't her mom still be at war like her father was injured so he was released and sent back but then shouldn't her mom have a job or else she'd be at war right like also, how, how are there so many reds in the world? If they're all at war and dying, how are their children? Is everybody just happening to marry somebody they're on leave with at the same time? Are people like out on the war fronts getting pregnant and having children and then sending them home? I don't, questions, I have questions. But then also, if there seems to be this equality between men and women, including in the silvers, because all the women also have superpowers, so they're badass and they can fight. And they're like, you know, generals and stuff who are women then why is there only queen's trial sure right now there's only princes but they stated like they always pick the queens so has there only ever been firstborn sons in the entirety of royal lineage because wouldn't it make sense if they're like considered on this equal level that if they had a daughter first then it would be like king's trial but it doesn't seem to, I don't know, maybe there was King's Trial, but it doesn't seem to say that, like, it's ever not Queen's Trial. So that seems weird to me. Thoughts. These are the thoughts I've been having. Does this make me hate it? No. I'm still having a fun time. 
I'm just overthinking everything <laughs> and, and it's a problem, but also it's fun. So, you know, I'm gonna eat my breakfast before it gets cold and I'm going to read some more. I'll come back to you. I, I'll probably do this obscenely detailed storytelling to you about all of it. This is completely spoiler filled. If you came here for spoiler free, like what are you doing? I'm reading the whole series in a vlog. Like I'm going to tell you everything that happens and my thoughts on it, okay? There we go. Okay. Hi, editing Michaela here. I'm going to be honest with you. The next clip is an absolute disaster. For some reason, my phone decided to focus on absolutely nothing. So apologies. Don't hate me. Okay, thanks. I am back for an update on Red Queen. I am what about two thirds through now so what has happened since i last spoke with you about this novel mare has been pretending to be a silver she's learning the ways she is training her electricity sparks you know she's becoming all powerful and what then like you know some weeks pass and then she just like breaks down in a lesson she runs out into a balcony and it's pouring rain it's very dramatic <laughs> And Maven comes and finds her and he's like, you're homesick, aren't you? I can help you with that. And so he ends up taking her to Cal and he's like, knock, knock, knock. Hey, want to take her home? And then he's like, probably shouldn't, but okay, because I have a cool motorcycle. They sneak out in the middle of the night because they're princes. Apparently they can just do whatever the heck they want to. So Cal and Mare leave on the motorcycle to go back to her home and she goes to see her family and she's all like, oh my god, my family, I haven't seen you in three weeks, wow. And they're all like, oh my god, Mare, you're here, look, all of your brothers are home from the war. Except for Shade, Shade is dead. They executed him because he deserted the army. And then she's like, that's not true, that's a lie. They killed him because he was part of the Scarlet Guard the rebellion group of reds that have been attacking places. Mare, after this, is like, I got one more stop to make. And so she goes to Will Whistle's wagon. That sounds so stupid. She's like, Will, I know you're part of the Scarlet Guard. I know Shade was, and that he died because of it. I'm gonna join up. Now she's all like, I'm part of the Scarlet Guard. She then leaves goes back. I mean, there's also this whole thing where there's like, Killorn comes, he's like, I'm gonna join the Scarlet Guard, and then Mary's like, no, you can't! I'm doing that to save you! She goes back to the castle, and then another week goes by while she's waiting for this midnight to appear, because she got this note that's like, midnight, and she's like, which midnight? So she's just waiting every day at midnight until somebody comes and fetches her and brings her to this place like it's an electrical blackout they shut off the power and she like shows up and farley is there who's the um like the head of the scarlet guard that she knows and then they're like where's the other one and she's like the other one someone else is joining who could it be and it's maven the prince she is betrothed to <laughs> and he's all like i'm joining the scarlet guard and they're like okay but like convince me why and he tells a story. This is something that confuses me. So he said that when he was 12, his father sent him to the war front where he followed around his father and Cal, who would have been 14 if he was 12, um, at the war front, and he like didn't like it. Um, and then there was this red who was 17 named Thomas, which is like, why is 17 year old Thomas at the war front fighting if conscription isn't until you're 18? Why is Thomas there? Also, he's like, Thomas didn't recognize me and actually treated me like a person and we were friends. And it's like, so the 17 year old was friends with 12 year old? Like, it's unclear about like how much time has passed while at the war front. Basically, he says how he watched him die and he couldn't save his life because his silver life was worth more than Thomas's red life, apparently. But everybody told him he's really upset about that. And so he wants to change the world. But now they're all like, we're gonna, we're gonna rebel, we're gonna change the world, me and Maven. We're little spies on the inside. 
It's like the whole next scene of like they're training, but it's not training because it's like this like dueling day. It's not called that, but I think it's fun if they call it duel day. They're just like fighting each other in like twos, and for some reason Cal is like so amazing that he like fights two people by himself, but it's like still super simple for him. It's not quite clear why he's so much better than everybody else. Whether it's like, oh, because he's the first son of the king, he's just stronger in his ability or like he just works like 10 majillion times more than everybody it's unclear then evangeline okay she's like i challenge marina because that's what mare's name is now and mare's like this bad this bad because if she makes me bleed it's all over it's the end this is like also something that confuses me is like i'm unsure like why evangeline hates Mare so much mostly because she didn't lose anything because she's there like she is still the one who's marrying the heir Cal nothing from her has been lost I don't really see the motivations behind her absolute like hatred towards Marina I can understand if she like dislikes her but she like really hates this gal and I'm like mm, why they end up like fighting and then like Mare gets like cut on the cheek and she's all like oh my god I gotta run I gotta hide Oh yeah. She like goes to Julian. He's the the uncle to to Cal because he's the brother of the old queen. Because Cal and Maven are half brothers because there was two queens. Because the, there's a new queen, but the old queen died, so he's the brother of the old queen. And he's all like, "Guess who's Skonos?" And Maven's like, mm, "I hate you people." And then Sarah Skonos comes and she's like, "Heal, heal, heal." And then you find out that like Sarah Skonos had her tongue cut out because she was telling lies about the current queen because she was like you killed the old queen she was best friends with the old queen so Sarah Skonos you know she's having none of it and then was punished for that very very severely now we're at the point where the big ball for the end of the summer and like queen's trial and all that is happening and Maven has like given four names of these silver elites that are going to be assassinated by the Scarlet Guard to like make point you know they can't run and hide anymore that's the plan but in the meantime every nightmare has just been going off with Cal to like learn how to dance because she can't dance very well there's this ball she's gonna have to dance at and she's all concerned about it so she's got they're like dancing together in the night and it's all like the feels oh my god and she's like i'm betraying maven and i'm betraying the scarlet guard and i'm betraying myself and then they end up kissing and she's like but it feels so good and you're like dang man okay because she's all like cal's the enemy because he's not part of the scarlet guard even though she like thinks he's a nice person so now she's like having this like conflict where like she's starting to get to know some of the silver people so she doesn't really want to see people like die and get hurt but she's also like part of the scarlet guard and she's like all for the revolution and she's like no these people deserve it because they're cruel i kind of like like that she has that inner conflict it it makes sense i also like how the timeline has slowed for this middle portion my biggest critique of the first bit of the book is that things just move too fast in the period of like one day in this man can you not man wakes up is taken by guards to the palace is made a servant witnesses queen's trial falls into the pit tries to run gets captured is knocked out wakes up in a cell is then brought to the king and queen tells her about how they're gonna make her into a silver princess is then brought to a bunch of servants to make her look like a silver person like they paint her so her red blood doesn't show have this like banquet thing where they announce the winner winners of the queen's trial she like afterwards is brought to like a room brought to bed that all happens in one day and that feels like too much to happen in one day there's like a part during that where she's like oh my god i haven't thought about my family in hours and it's like yeah her guilt doesn't make as much sense for not thinking about her family that she's left behind because it's been like literally not even a day there was even a chance for you to forget about that versus if it maybe was spanned over two days instead it would have been more to my liking it's like really nitpicky 
I'm not saying it's like the worst thing ever. It's just a little bit. I was like, that's a long ass day. Some like world building things that just like don't line up for me. They've just told everybody she's a silver and like nobody seems to be questioning it. They're claiming she has this like power that resulted from her mom and her father's powers like combining even though like having combo powers is not a thing that anybody else has and they're just like she's a silver girl and now she's a princess and i can understand if none of the other elite silvers are publicly questioning it but i feel like there should be a bit more of like behind the scenes to just mare there's only kind of like one scene where somebody's like hmm, your eyes are not the same color as your parents and i'm like that's why we're questioning. We're not questioning the fact that you lived 17 years of your life and you've never bled ever to find out that you're silver. That's not a question anybody's asking. Seems odd, but okay. For me, it's like there's small things that are very easy to overlook in the book and to just enjoy it. But if you do like sit and dwell and think about them, you start falling into this like questioning circle of like wait a second wait a second wait a second the ball is coming up things are gonna blow people are gonna die stay tuned i'll let you know please ignore my extremely chapped lips okay for we're dealing with them they hate me right now because it's winter i hate them because they keep splitting open and bleeding i have finished red queen hopefully you can see this i don't usually film while holding the camera but what has happened since I last updated you, since I am doing this full-fledged synopsis thing, it appears. We have had the attack during the ball. Can you calm down? And it kind of went wrong because one of the people they were trying to kill didn't die. And then also there was like an explosion, which they thought was like a, a bomb at first. And then of course the Silvers were like, it's a bomb, they're just trying to kill everybody. They have no reason. They're horrible people. Look at these Scarlet Guards killing children and innocents. In reality, it was just like a gas explosion by accident or something. From that, like some of the Scarlet Guard get captured and put in a cell. And then Mare's like, oh no, it's all of the people in the Scarlet Guard that I actually know. Okay, I actually just need to put this my phone down. Of course, like the people that are captured are four people. And it is the four people in the Scarlet Guard that we know. Farley, Walsh, who is a Red Servant, that Mare knows, um, Killorn, her friend, and Tristan, who's this redhead guy that was in um, Will Whistle's wagon the second time she went to Will Whistle's wagon to sign up for the Scarlet Guard. Actually, those are the four people who are captured. And then Cal goes and like has Farley like tortured to like get answers. But of course it doesn't work because torture doesn't work. And then Mare's all like, Ew, I now hate Cal because he's torturing people. Ridiculous. They end up like saying how, you know, like this isn't working. We need to go address the people. And they're like, we'll have the queen interrogate their minds tomorrow. Which seems stupid because it's like, why can't you just grab the queen now? But okay. Later, that same night, Mare is like, I have to help them escape. So she goes to Julian because Julian's a singer. So he can like look people in the eye and like tell them to do stuff so she ropes him in to like helping them escape and it works but she gets shot and she bleeds everywhere but then she's healed because julian like sings to the healer guard and he's like healer i say this because he's like they're like asleep at the time so he's like peeling their eyelids open so he can sing to them that's you know i'll find a dandy so then the next day mere hours later because this is in the middle of the night that they escape the next morning she's like wow awfully quiet around here and it's because everybody's leaving and then they're on the boat to go to the capital now because they're like we need to leave and then while they're on the boat mayor is like to navy she's like that was my blood they're gonna find me and he's like oh, that's not good I'll think of something, we'll figure it out, we'll get there. And then Mare, like, once they're at the Capitol, is, like, forced to, like, read the speech that that is, like, broadcasted to, like, everyone being, like, conscription is now at 15 and there's a curfew and 
we'll kill anybody who breaks the rules. And then she's like, I feel really guilty, but it's like she was forced to do that. So then her and Maven go out and about, like shaking hands and things, to be like, look, we're silvers and we're strong and we're powerful, kissing babies on heads and stuff. And then Mare like sneaks out because she's like, I need to go find the Scarlet Guard. And this random child like gives her a piece of paper and it's like, I think you dropped this. And she's like, I did not drop that, but she takes it anyway. And she realizes that it's a message from the Scarlet Guard that's like, go to this theater. And she's like, I don't even know what a theater is. So she hands it to Maven and Maven's like, I don't know what a theater is. So they go to the theater and then they like crawl up through the ceiling or whatever and like go find the, this under train, which is basically a subway, that they ride with Farley to the um the ruin city, which I've been pronouncing Narse in my head. I don't know if that is correct, but that is what I will be calling it. So they go to Narse and Mary's like, you have to see this book because but she's at the capital. She was left a gift by Julian who had to run away because obviously he like helped a bunch of prisoners escape and he left her a gift and it was this book that has like a list of like all of these other red people who have the same blood mutation as Mare so they also have these powers and he's like you gotta find them, you gotta help them so she like gives this to Farley, she's like look we have we could have an army and then Maven is like we have an army and everybody's like Maven what are you talking about, no we don't like there are like five people in the Scarlet Guard now <laughs> and he's like no no we'll have a coup so they decide they're gonna like run this coup to take over the government because in the capital basically there's this bridge that like divides it in two and like everything you need to run the entire government system is over on one side really poor city planning okay like they should have thought ahead about the fact that you could just blow up a bridge and isolate the entire government doesn't sound like a good plan so since they were like hey you know what we blew up the Somerton place the hall of hall of sun is that what it's i don't even know i can't, i don't remember the names of these places the the whole like ball attack was literally like last night or no like a day ago it was like a day ago and they're like okay well now we're gonna do a coup and it's gonna be like this morning <laughs> Like, they literally, like, it's the afternoon, and they're planning a coup for Dawn, and I'm like, mm, and you wonder why it didn't work? Like, I don't feel like you can plan things that quickly, but they do. Um, the plot doesn't have any chance to breathe. Like, it would have been so easy to just, like, put a tiny bit of a time jump so that there's at least more than, like, just hours between all of these huge major events that happen. They decide to have this coup where, like, Mayor is going to be like, come you have to join me and everybody's like yeah because cal is like in love with you it's totally gonna work <laughs> they try to do this coup at dawn and guess what it doesn't work they blow up the bridge the scarlet guard tries to run away in in the tunnels but then it sounds like they all get murdered kind of sucks not fun maven and mare are like captured and they're like brought into this room that's like soundproof for some reason up in a tower and they're like mm, weird and then the arvin guy who can silence their abilities is there anyway there's a whole little like 360 little roundabout that happens okay shock 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 twist 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 okay because alara the queen is there and she's like mm, let me just use my little whisper power on the king and be like submit on your knees beach and then everybody's like, what are you doing? And then Maven is like, mm, let me just rip out of these <laughs> these handcuffs and go stand by my mother. And Mary's like, ah, let me rip out of my handcuffs. And then she realizes, I can't rip out of my handcuffs. <gasps> and then her and Cal are like, ah, Maven, you betrayed us. And he's like, uh, yeah, duh, I'm on my mom's side. Like everything I said was a lie. And then Cal is like, ah, and Mary is like, and then the king is like, I can't do anything because I'm under the mind control of the queen. Then the queen makes Cal murder the king, beheads him with his own sword. And Cal is like, ah! And then the king is like, it's okay, it's not you. And then he murders him. But like not, he murders him because Alara is making him 
murder him. And then Maven is like, mm-hmm. And the queen is like, mm-hmm, because they turned the power back on. So the cameras are running now. So now all that everybody sees, because there has been no cameras before now, and it's a soundproof room up in a tower, because everybody has a soundproof room in the tower. The queen is like crying her eyes out and like being the grieving person, and the, there's a beheaded king, and then Cal's covered in blood, and then Maven is like, yeah! So then Mayor's like, Cal, we gotta go. So they run, but they get captured, because, like, duh. And then they're brought to, like, the Bowl of Bones, which is where they used to have all of these executions, but then they didn't. But they're like, mm, let's revive that. Could be useful. Cal and Mayor are all like, mm, guess we're gonna die. Yeah, we're gonna die. Even though we hate each other, we're in solidarity together because we both hate Maven. And then Maven has this like little moment where he comes to visit them in the cell. Because again, this is like the same day as the coup still, I would like to point out. Like the coup happened at dawn, they were captured, the king was beheaded, they were sent into this prison, and now this is still the same day. He comes by and he's like, I can save you, Mare. And she literally spits in his eye. And then he's like, okay, wow, F you. Um, you're gonna die. But we get to like the arena, which is actually the next day. For once, we actually wait a day for something. And they're gonna be sentenced to death. So they're put in through these little suits. Cal got his little sparky bracelet back so he can fire, fire, flame, flame. And they're like sent into the arena. Mare is like not allowed to use her powers because now Maven, who's the king, is all like, the red tricked us with, with technology. And everybody is just like, yeah, it makes sense. I believe it. And then Arvin is there to make sure that Mara can't use her powers, but like Cal can because, you know, he's a he's a prince, so he gets to die with dignity. Okay. They're like, you know what's the best way to execute these people? Not just with like a gun, because there's guns in this world. No, they're like, we're going to get six other really powerful silvers to attack them. So they have like this strong arm, the, the nymph who can control water, which is like deadly to Cal because he's fire, but water beats fire. And then there's the Ptolemus and Evangeline, brother and sister, the Magnetrons, who can like control metal and stuff. And then there's um, the shadow guy who can like make himself invisible. So initiate giant fight, Mary's all like, ah, 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 run, run, run. And then Cal's like, flame, 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 flame. Like, not looking good. But then like Mary does this thing where she forces like the, the strong arm to like kill Arvin by accident so then she had the powers again. Anyway, it turns out that they end up winning. Ptolemus and Evangeline end up running away. The other people, they, they did. Dead, dead. Killed, shocked, poof. And then they're like, hey, we won. But like, Maven has like shut off the world. He's like cleared it out because like nobody should know that Mera's actually have the ability because now his lie he told like two minutes ago is not, not being very convincing anymore now is it so then a bunch of like gun people come out you know they're all like we got guns we're gonna kill you because it's like what you thought you were gonna beat all those executioners and then maybe it would just be like ah, dang guess you're free to go that's not what happens and then mayor like makes a lightning storm come and then some people like run away because they're like oh, oh dang that's a really big electrical storm and then they think they're gonna die, but then the people who are about to shoot them actually get shot, and then they get pulled into a hole, and then they're like saved by the Scarlet Guard, and then they're on a train, and then Shade is there, and Mare's like, aren't you dead? And he's like, no. So her brother is alive, fun. Cal is there, he's in cuffs again, even though he can very easily break out of them, but he's just like a defeated man. And like, Farley's still alive, and Killorn is still alive, because obviously they're they're the, like the two people we know. They already killed Walsh and Tristan. Like we only know two more people the Scarlet Guard. Like they can't die. Otherwise, who is the Scarlet Guard? Now everybody's all like, revenge, we will get them. Maven, go to hell. And that's where the book ends. I'd say like overall, I think the first time I read it, it was, I gave it a three stars. And I would like say that that's accurate for now too. It was like an enjoyable read. My complaints, for things that I didn't think quite work is there were a couple more places where I got like taken out of the world of it because of a few comments that are made that don't have any any basis. So like they there's times when 
Mare's referred to as like a red devil and a devil and Alara is referred to as like a witch but like witches and devils aren't things in this world because there's as far as I can tell there's no religion despite there being mentioned of like old gods and gods and devils and witches like but there's that's not like actually built into the world so it just kind of like is a little jarring to read because it's like Uh, our world and our language being placed into this one without thinking of how it's not built into this world which is like again not like a huge deal but it is something that I've noticed one of the other things that bothers me is the fact that the the red blood in the cells from when the Scarlet Guard were like freed and Mare's like that was my blood they're gonna find me and then they're the the plan they come out with for this is to convince them that they need to destroy every record of mayor because they're trying to convince the world that she's silver so they need to make sure there's like nothing that says otherwise which when you're like oh yeah that make that that makes sense if there's if her red blood doesn't exist anymore in any system then they can't match it right but then if you go one step further you're like wait though if they get to the if everybody is in the system and then they find the blood and it's not in the system But there's only one person who's not in the system. Guess who it's going to be? So that doesn't make sense. But then it does make sense because Alara was trying to make Mare's plan work to make her own plan work. So some of these things were just overlooked on purpose. So I guess that kind of makes my argument null. So I guess I take that back. I think the biggest issue I had is that the amount of time you feel is passing when you read it is not equal to the amount of time that's actually passed. So it feels like you're reading things that are happening over like days and days and days, but then it all happens like in much less time than that. So it just doesn't feel like aligned very well and I kind of wish that it did, again, like it just like the plot breathed a bit more. Like the fact that like the coup happened like 24 hours after the ball attack too much that that's too much happening in way too short of time i guess it's time to start reading the next one until then toodaloo i am back so i'm about 60 pages into glass sword and the book really picks up exactly where we left off so they're in the under train on the way to Nerse because they are running after the events of the Bowl of Bones arena execution escape scenario that happened. They're there, they're running. Of course, they can't actually run to Nerse because Maven knows that Nerse isn't actually like full of radiation and that it's not safe so they know they can actually show up there because of all of the betrayal they're running running away shades alive mary's brother he is in fact not dead he also has teleporting abilities so he is like part of the same mutation scenario as mare where they're red blood but they have like the abilities of silvers but not actual silver abilities, they're like completely new abilities, but they're abilities the way that silvers have abilities. Okay, so they get the Nerse, and for some reason they like split up. I don't know why they split up. I'm very confused about why they split up, because when they first get there, Maven's army and the Jets aren't quite there, so I don't know why they didn't just like run to the river, and instead they like split up and then went about all these like roundabout ways of like running around this ruined town. And they end up, like, getting in all these, like, fights and stuff. Shade gets shot a couple of times in, like, the leg and the arm, I believe. Because he's protecting Mare. Because it's, like, Mare, Killorn, and Shade go off. And then you don't know what happens to, like, the other people. But eventually, Mare finds, like, Farley and Cal again. And Mare and Cal, like, use their powers to, like, create this, like, wall while they're retreating and they like jump off a little cliff into a river but it's not a river it's actually a submarine but they don't call them submarines here they call them mersives like submersives yes 
we are on the submarine and Mare wakes up and it's like five hours later so one can only assume that means it's still in fact the same day it's just the middle of the night because the bowl of bones thing was in the morning so it's been again it's been one day we love it also something that bothers me is that while they're in Nerse, like fighting the silvers show up there's like one point where Mare gets like injuries to her ears from a banshee scream which we can only assume is a silver ability and they call the silvers with this screaming ability banshees but in this world we don't have any basis for the lore of banshees so how would they have that as a term to use to describe a silver ability like shouldn't they just be called like screamers or like something to do with sonar I don't know. It just felt really odd to me. There's a couple things happen on the submarine. Again, none of it really feels like crazy important to tell you. Um, they find out that they're going to Tuck, which is an island in the middle of the ocean. We um, find out that there's others there, so there's more Scarlet Guard as well as Mare's family because there's a bunch of like red refugees also on this Tuck island. So they end up getting there in the middle of the night and then like this guy comes out who we can tell he's like bad because he has this like bloody red eye which I can only assume is like the blood vessels in his eye broke so it's like his eye is now like blood red instead of like the white is what I'm, what I'm thinking. So clearly like bad guy vibes and we find out that this guy is referred to as the colonel and nothing else anyway he like is like hey cal on your knees hands behind your back you're a prisoner and then mayor is like shocked by this she's like how dare they which i understand for her that she has mixed feelings about cal because he's supposed to be her enemy but they have that whole thing where they like dance in the moonlight and kiss or whatever so she's like and then also, like, his entire family either is dead or betrayed him at this point. So, like, I get why she has feelings against doing this. But I feel like she should also understand why the Scarlet Guard would do that to Cal. Perhaps. Just saying. Just saying. So, Cal's taken away by the Colonel Blood Eye Man. And Mary goes in and is, like, reunited with her family and then wakes up the next day. It's finally the next day. We love it. But again, okay, this is going to be something that I just hyper-focus on, and I understand that it's extremely nitpicky, but I'm going to complain about it anyway. Why do we keep bringing up school? There is now twice in this book where school is just, like, thrown out with no context. First, it's, like, on the submarine when Shade's in the, like, infirmary area on the submarine, and Mary goes to see him, and he's pretending to sleep, and she goes, ugh, he used to pretend to sleep at school. And then secondly, when she was waking up in the barracks on the island of Tuck, she's like still has her eyes closed and is like, I can just pretend that I'm back home trying to decide if I'm going to go to school that day. And again, we don't know this. Like, what is school? It's something that's just sometimes said, but we have no context for it. We don't, and it also doesn't make any sense for it to even exist, as I have already had in my previous rant about the school thing. We cannot call back to Mare's previous life as a schoolgirl because that world and that existence of Mare does not exist. We have never had a scene at school. It is only ever just this throwaway word in certain points that makes no sense that we keep bringing up school. And I am, I am angry about it. Unnecessarily angry. Yes, I'm upsetting spaghetti about the school continuation of mentioning school when it is unnecessary to do so and it's like making me just think it's it's this weird thing that's just there to connect mayor to young adult audiences when there's no basis in this world for school and we have no idea what school is like we've had no descriptions of of the school of how the school works if it was nice to be at school if it was bad to be at school what they were taught at school 
how strict of a structure school was. Like, it's just said as school, and there's no nothing else about it. And then they just keep saying it in the series over and over again. And I don't get it. It even, hold on, hold on. Because I noted this yesterday, only when I was putting the dust jacket back on the first book, that the back of the book has a huge quote about school. Like, it's going to be this huge thing in the book that, like, school is, like, a huge plot point. It's not. We, we only talk about school to confuse and anger me. It's like a personal attack on me to continue to mention school. Moving on. She wakes up. She goes to get breakfast at the mess hall with her sister, Jesus. And she's like, Jesus, where's Cal? Do you know where Cal is? And Jesus is like, I don't really know, but like I heard our brothers talking about it yesterday and I think he's in barracks one. And Mayor's like, barracks one, okay cool noted and then she like looks at all the buildings which for some reason all of the barracks have gigantic large numbers on them we love that very convenient and there is no one so where's cal mystery mystery surprise surprise shock shock so that's where i am i mainly just had to come on here to rant about the school thing again because honestly it's bothering me so much well i swear to god if we get the book four and they're still talking about school personally attacked personally i'm all i'm saying Okay, I will see you at the next update. Good morning. We are back. So I'm about, I'm gonna say over halfway, a little over halfway, that's what we're going with. I will say I'm very entertained. Like one thing that this series continues to do is just keep me guessing. Like I never know what is going to be happening next. And it, it, it results in a fun ride. I'm not gonna lie, I'm having fun. So they were on Tuck, they had escaped to Tuck, the island, and Cal was taken, and he was like put into like the mysterious barracks one. Mare and Killorn go to talk to Shade and Farley in the infirmary, and they get the key from Farley to like the cell that Cal's kept in, and she tells them about barracks one, and it's like underwater, under the, under the dock on the island, so Mare and Killorn like swim 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 their way there and they like find him and they like go to unlock it because like they're not planning to like escape mayor just like wants to talk to him so that happens we also discover through this that the colonel who is a lake lander i don't know if i said that before or not that there's there's a bunch of lake landers on the island, so they discovered the Scarlet Guard. It's like much bigger than they first thought. So they find out that the Colonel is Farley's father. I really hope that this is going to come up to be of some importance later on in the story. Because as of right now, it really doesn't change much. Maybe, maybe that little tidbit is going to come back. I hope so, because otherwise... I will be kind of disappointed because I want that thread to go somewhere. <laughs> when they're unlocking the door to like go talk to Cal, there's like stompy stompy boot boots on, on the ground. And then Killorn shoves Mare into the cell and locks her in and she's like, oh, I've been betrayed. Then her and Cal are both in this cell that has the like silent stone or whatever that like so they can't use their powers. It's like, I think it's still the same day because it's like dinner. So they haven't even been on Tuck for 24 hours. Um, they arrived there like before dawn. And then like that afternoon, they went to go try and talk to Cal. And now it's like dinner time of that same day. And the Colonel shows up um, and he has a couple guards and then they have Farley and then Killorn is there. And Killorn has like a box of syringes and he, Farley's all like, and so he like injects her with one and she's thrown in a cell because she's like passed out from whatever the drug is. And then Killorn with said box of syringes and the colonel come into the cell and then they're locked in the cell with Calamere, which seems like a bad plan, but okay. So they're all like chatty chatty, what are you gonna do? Meh 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 meh. And the colonel's all like, I'm gonna trade Cal over to Maven because Maven said he'll put the conscription age back up to 18 instead of 15. And everybody's like, 
he's not gonna do that like that is pointless like you should be using Cal for his like inside thoughts and whatever instead what happens is Killorn like accidentally drops boxes of syringes and then the colonel's like oh, you stupid boy and then killer one's like not that stupid stabby stabby and then the colonel he's gone out cold but then they're like hmm now we're still all locked in this cell though but then outside it's like oh pop there's shake he can teleport and then he's like has a crutch and he's like bang bang the guards are down lets everybody out and then they the four of them, because Farley's like, ha ha, I wasn't actually knocked out. I fake knocked out. It's part of the plan. Also, we stole the list back. So then they're like, jump, jump, jump their way around with Shade. And they end up in a hangar for airplanes. And there's a jet in there. They steal the jet, because Cal can fly jets. And they fly out in the jet. And they're like, where are we going to go? And Farley's like, here. And it turns out there's like a bunch of like old ruins that the Scarlet Guard has up kept to keep as like runways for their stolen jets, even though they only have two stolen jets that we know of. So they're doing a lot of work. So they land in this place and they're and Mare's like, there's a red nearby that we're going to go save who has a mutation. So that's like their next plan of action. The four of them go out into the woods and to this like small red town to get this guy. Cal and Mare and Killorn hang out in the woods because Cal and Mare are like the two most wanted people in the entire country. And then Killorn, Mare says it's because Maven knows his name so he's also like on the wanted list. Whereas like Farley's a lake lander and everybody thinks Shade is dead so they can go. Really I think it's just because Killorn and Cal like hate each other and so we want more of, of them just like having awkwardness being around each other anyway Farley and Shade go they come back they have this new guy named Nix and then Nix is all like what am I doing here and then Mare's like you're different like me and then Nix is like you're right but then he sees Cal and he just like attacks him he starts like beating it up turns out like Nix has this like impenetrable skin thing as his mutation like he can't he can't beat him up very easily Anyway, turns out he was beating up Cal because his two daughters died in this, like, tactical plan on the war front that Cal came up with. So Cal's, like, responsible for their death. They end up being able to recruit him into this, like, the Scarlet Guard people anyway. And they go back off into their plane and then they fly again to a, um, a new place that's close to Harbor Bay, which is, like, one of the big silver cities. And they're like, there's three more people here, like two in the city and then one in the slums that they're gonna try and save. So they decide they're gonna break into to Harbor Bay. And Farley's like, oh, I'll, I have, I got people everywhere. They'll meet us. Now, here's a question that I have. What kind of communication is happening in this world? Because it's not explained. There's a lot of technology, but there's no like technology over like communication. So I don't know if people have phones or something similar they have like some kind of like text devices like are they still sending letters like I don't know how are people communicating in this world at all because it seems like people seem to know what's going on far distances away from each other but I don't know how so they go to the tunnels and they meet these people who are from Harbor Bay that are like part of the Scarlet Guard and there's um Krantz okay and he has like three goons who we never learned the names of. And they're like, we'll, we'll take you into the Harbor Bay. But then things start being like sketchy, sketchy. And they're in the tunnels and like seems sketchy, sketchy. Turns out that they find out through like being like spy spies and asking questions. They're like, the, the, the tensions rise. And then Kranz is like, yeah, actually Maven has like taken all of the the gangs in Harbor Bay and like has taken something from all of them and wants like you talking to Mare in return. So like everybody and their dog is hunting you down. So then they're like fight fight in the tunnels and it causes the collapse and the three goons, they're dead. Somehow everybody with a name survives. They're running trying to escape the continually collapsing tunnels. They get out but they're in like 
a different area of the town than they thought they would be because Krantz is like, look, my gang is like waiting on the other side of that door over in this other part out of the tunnel waiting to capture you. So he brought them to like this area of town that's controlled by the the Sea Skulls, is that the name? France's um, gang is the Mariners, and this is the Sea Skulls. So then they're like trying to sneak through this part of town, all of them, but they're being like stalked by Sea Skulls, and they're like, shit, 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 shit. But the Sea Skulls actually, they recognize Krantz and they beat him up, but Shade is like keeping an eye on Krantz, so he gets like caught up in it. So then all these Sea Skulls people are like beating up Krantz and Shade, and then Mayor Cal and Farley are like, look, we hate to leave you because this seems like a really unfortunate scenario, but we really got to get to that security center so that we can get the names. And this is like a really good distraction so nobody notices us. So they leave him. They're like, bye, Shade. Have fun being beat up when you're already on a crutch, which again, I also don't understand how he's even walking with one. He only has one crutch. So he's like limping. He was shot in the leg like two days ago. I don't think he'd be walking right now, but maybe he is just an amazing healer, perhaps. So they, the rest of them go and they get to the security center and they're like, we're gonna break in through the back door. And Cal's like, I don't really wanna kill anybody. And Mara's like, why? Cause they're silver. And he's like, yeah. And then she's like, but you were ready to kill a bunch of reds. And he's like, I have been called out for my hypocrisy. Cal's like, look, I'll help you, but like, I'm not gonna like kill anybody. And Mara's like, all right, I'll just shock them all to death anyway. Like I give a damn. So they break in through the back door. They're like, guards, guards, boom, boom, shock, shock, death, death. And they get into this, like, there's like a computer room that has all the records. So Cal like puts up this wall of fire to like give them time. And they decide they're gonna like print out the locations of not just the three people in the area, but like everybody in the, um, the, the beacon region of the world because it's all kept into this one computer so they there's like 10 of them they print the names out it's like you know time crunch like people are coming we're gonna get beat up this like stone guy like the stone skin he just breaks through for a second and then cal like throws him out and he's like well guess guess you are hurt in silvers aren't you they get the names and mayor like breaks the computer and then they're like running away running away running away bam 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 secret tunnels run 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 then they get like surrounded and they're like there's no way out we are surrounded but then pop shade comes he pops in he pops them out and then they're like oh wow fun okay great it's been one second so time to go grab one of those reds and they walk sneaky sneaky sneak 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 um to the place where walliver i think his name is walliver is but then instead of finding walliver they find walliver's body and they're like we were too late. We have failed. And then Mare's like, we have to at least take him down. Cause he's like hanging. He's like, we have to, you know, save his body. And Cal's like, no, don't touch him. It's a trap. And it is a trap. He's like, can you see it's like way too quiet and like nobody's around? Nobody touch him. This is a trap. And then out of the alley, who comes? Maven. Maven's like, mm. a trap indeed. And then they're like fighting, 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 but there's this weird like clicking thing. And Mare is like, she can't like function. She's like, I don't know what's happening. She's in all this pain. And she's like, I'm dying. This is the end. Maven has caught us. And then she like blacks out. And that's uh, the part I've read up to now. So fun, fun, fun. I am shot. I also would like to continue my rampage against a singular small point. When they're like climbing out of the tunnels and they're in like the sea skull area there's like a bunch of posters of their faces of like cal and mare being like their wanted posters and she's like makes this comment about how like none of them can read what it says but like they get the point and i'm like i'm sorry none of the reds can read aren't they going to school hmm what happened to school? Is school not here? Is school only for you, Mayor? Are you the only person who goes to school? I 
I swear I will be haunted by school for the entirety of this series. It's, it's fine. It's fine. Again, it is like extremely fast paced. I think it would have been nice if they spent a little bit more time on Tuck because they weren't even on the island of Tuck for more than 24 hours. I would have loved a bit more of the dynamic that's going on there. It's kind of just told to us that it like feels sketchy and we don't trust people and everybody fears Mare because she's like different and powerful and so there's like all these negative things and that's like why they escape because they all knew eventually her and Shade would be locked away and the colonel expresses how he like he calls them things and he like has no interest in trying to save any of the other reds that have abilities. I just think I would have liked to see that like shown more than to be told it. Otherwise I'm like, you know, I'm having I'm having fun. I'm having a good time. A little bit I'm like, mm, where could this possibly go now? I'm I'm going to find out cuz I'm going to be reading it, you know. We will find out. So, I guess like my next update might just be like when I finish the book cuz I do in fact need to finish it today because my library loan is due back tomorrow at like 8 in the morning. So, we're gonna be speed reading this. We're gonna be speed reading. Thank God it's Saturday, so I have the time. <laughs> so I finished Glass Sword. Thanks. And I liked it. The second half of the book saved it a bit for me. So yeah, let's get into that. Where we left off, Mare was all like being murdered basically by this clicking machine thing in Harbor Bay and then so the next thing we know she's waking up and she's like in this like hut in the middle of the forest and Cal and Killorns is there and she's like what happened and then they fill her in basically she's been out for like four days and they thought she was gonna die Shade was able to like teleport them out to safety as he always does in the meantime while she's been out cold they have continued to like go along the list and like find more new bloods as they call them the pe red blooded people with the gene mutation that gives them abilities so they've been like finding new people and they've been bringing them back to this place that ends up being titled the notch i like this part of the plot because it actually slowed things down a bit and it felt relatively aligned with how much time is passing versus how I felt how much time is passing while reading it. I think I found out why so much of the series so far has felt really misaligned in that way for me. And it's because, for example, like when they're on Tuck, where they're in the infirmary after having breakfast, and then there's like, a break to move to the next scene where then they're outside folding clothes and stuff waiting to for the right moment to break into barracks one under the dock and what that does is that it makes you think a bunch of time has passed but in reality it hasn't so it almost would have been better if they just like put in a paragraph where it was like and then we walked from the infirmary out to the main area talk about the weather a bit say like oh we met up with my family as they're holding an incoming clothing shipment and then went into the scene like the fact that you skip that little bit makes it feel to me at least as a reader a more significant amount of time has passed because there is no mention at the end of like the infirmary scene that that's what immediately is happening next it's not like if they got up from say they're like sitting at a table and they're like, okay, well, let's go grab groceries. And then you skip to them being at the grocery store. You know that's the next like thing in the sequence of events, so it doesn't feel like a huge amount of time passed. But if you don't reference the next activity in like that previous scene, then it feels like more time has passed than actually has, which I feel like it explains why I've been like, how has it only been like two days? This doesn't make any sense. It feels like it has been much longer than that. I find like a, a little bit of comfort in the fact that I, I feel like I have an answer to that feeling that I have. But anyway, we're back to the plot. <laughs> this part of the plot kind of like slows down and is more of a jumping over a period of time. They are going on all of these daily quests 
basically to find more new bloods. A lot of the times they fail and they don't get there before Maven and people are missing or they're dead, but they also find new ones and they bring them back to the notch and they're training them. And you get to meet a bunch of new people. I feel like they were introduced a little too quickly without too many individual scenes for you to really like connect to any of them. But there's like Gareth can fly. He can manipulate gravity. So as a result, he can fly. And then there's like Nanny, who's this old woman who can like transform herself to look like anybody. She can like morph another like person like Nyx who's just like indestructible. And there's someone who can, Herrick is his name I think, he can like make illusions so that like basically can hide people. Like he can make other people see illusions so he can mask anything, right? Like he can make it look like he's not there or that he's a different person or whatever. And so they bring him on one of these missions to find more new bloods and to like get into this guarded kind of town because you know like they're very high on the wanted list and when they get there it's actually a trap that is set up by Maven in this house that they're going to new bloods and they're like hmm it's really dusty in here seems whack and then over in the corner there's like a basket there's like a, a baby in it the baby is dead maven has killed the baby and there's like an alarm in the basket that sets off so they all like hair conveniently is there to make them all invisible in the house so they're not caught and then mare finds a note in the basket with the baby and it's from maven that's like every one of these deaths is because of you like surrender now come back to me because there's this ongoing thing of how like maven where he has like this obsession with mare where he doesn't want to let her go he doesn't want her to be against him and we've seen this from the beginning of like not the beginning we've seen this from the end of the first book where when she's arrested he has this moment where he kind of flicks back to like the maven she knew where he's like i can save you mare like just tell me you'll stay with me and like i'll I'll save you, I won't I won't kill you, like I'll kill Cal. And of course Mary's like, mm, no. And so this seems to be like continuing where this like thread of Maven's humanity is in his obsession with Mare, but that's also where all of his disdain and all of his violence is coming from too. It's it's interesting. I like it that that's his character. I feel a little bit like he's gone a bit too big bad. I wish we were leaning in a bit more to explore more why he has this obsession with Mare. What about Mare hooked him, right, and is making him act this way? Mare also has these like conflicting feelings where she, she's like with Cal but not with Cal because she keeps doing this thing where it's like he's a distraction, I can't be with him, it won't work out because like we're not actually allies. And then like when they're at the notch they end up starting to like sleep together as in like actually sleeping just in the same room and it's this idea that they're both so alone that the only companionship they can find is with each other and that Mare has been keeping all of these notes from Maven because after the first one she's been getting like finding more and more of them and she hasn't been destroying them and she hasn't been told anybody else about them but she keeps them all in a bag in the corner of her room and it's to do with that she like misses who she thought he was and then she feels guilty for having those feelings and then she feels you know, all she has is Cal but that she can't trust Cal because there's like this whole overarching theme of like anyone can betray anyone that started in like the first book so she can't trust anybody fully and so she feels really isolated and she kind of like uses Cal to like feel a little less isolated. I also kind of wish that Cal was fully developed more as a character I think he could have been a lot more interesting and it's hard to do this when the book is written in like first person from Mare's perspective to develop Cal as a character further because obviously we can't see anything other than through Mare's lens and Mare's thoughts but you have to think like Cal was like this like purebred silver heir to the throne he was against rebellion because all he saw was the destruction it would cause and he couldn't see a good outcome coming from it. He didn't love the way the world was functioning that he was in it, but he also wasn't willing to fight to change that. 
So he was just kind of going with the flow of everything. And he was going to be king. And then, of course, at the end of the first book, his world is turned, like, upside down because he's forced to murder his father. And then his brother it betrays him and his stepmom. And then he's officially lost, like, everybody in his life. And all he has is Mare and the Scarlet Guard, but he doesn't believe in that. He's stuck in this revolution place and he's helping them because he doesn't want any more people to be hurt by maven but he doesn't really believe in the in the cause and i think again like that could have been really interesting to explore and i don't really feel like it was that was like a little a little disappointing they go on like another mission they take nanny and gareth and so they're gonna they're gonna fly he's gonna fly nanny into the security post when she's like disguised herself as like one of the security officers or whatever to get in and then while they're doing that her farley shade and cal go to this like nearby abandoned village it caught fire and burned down and so it was evacuated and they're like there might be like supplies there that we can like steal let's go check it out and then this is also where it's like very heavily hinted that like Shade and Farley are together and also that Farley is probably pregnant because they like have this have this little like scene where Gareth is like oh like Farley was the last one to travel with me and she got like she puked afterwards and then Mary's like Farley's been sick recently and then they she keeps like having these thoughts about how much Shade's like always looking at Farley and they're always together and they're always smiling and they're happy compares them to how Julian and Sarah were together and like they were in love so like it's it's pretty obvious to everybody except for apparently Mare apparently she did not notice but okay so they go to this burned down village and they come across John John is very creepy he's weird and he's like dressed all in gray and he's got like bloodshot eyes and he's all like Ooh, I can see the future and he's like knows exactly what they're going to say and stuff because he can see everything that's ever going to happen proves to them that his power is really he's not like just playing mind games of lying by saying like oh gareth and nanny are going to get caught they're going to be set into this trap and they're going to show up at the jet but they're not and they're going to be injured he's going to have a leg injury but it's not going to be that as bad as it looks and like nothing farley can't handle the patch up and that becomes true. And then Mare's like, I believe you. And he tells them that Koros prison, I think it's called Koros, is holding all of these new bloods that they thought were just missing, but like Maven has captured them and put them in this prison, along with Julian and Sarah are there, and like all these other silvers who have been like defying Maven or questioning him has been sent to this prison. And Mare's like, we have to break them out. And, and John's like, if you do, can't be four days from now because if you go four days from now you'll die and they're like oh dang we gotta break into this place in three days why are you saying that's not that much time there because like all of your other plans have happened like hours after you thought of them but okay and he says like you have to fly to this lake and whatever you find there you have to protect it and so they do that they go to this lake and they find Cameron who is a new blood she broke out of the prison and is like running away and so mayor is like you have to help us and tell us all about the prison so that we can do a prison break and get everybody out and cameron's like no i'm going to the to the choke like the war front because her twin brother is there in the little legion which is the legion of soldiers that Maven has made out of all of the like 15 to 16 year olds that are now being conscripted and he's basically planning to just send them to die as like a point to the reds because Maven's just big bad evil and so Mare ends up forcing Cameron to come with them and this is kind of like a turning point for Mare in her character development where before now she's always been like, everybody has the choice, nobody has to be involved if they don't want to be. And of course, now she's officially, like, broken that rule and, and has taken somebody for the greater good to save more new bloods to get those people out of the prison. 
So it's a bit of her losing her, her morality. And this is a theme that continues through the end of the book. So they bring Cameron back. They discover on the plane that Cameron is actually like a crazy intense silencer to the point that she just silences people, not just their powers, but like everything about them until they basically would, would just die. They bring her back. They plan this prison break. There's like 13 of them or something that are going to go. They have this plan where like Nanny's going to disguise herself as Maven to get them in and then they are going to like break all the doors out. The whole prison break thing happens. They're breaking everybody out of the prison. It's going decently, considering. When they're there, though, there's, like, Mayor loses more of her morality, and she kills a bunch of Silvers who are trapped in this room, like, begging for their lives to, like, not be killed, and she kills them anyway, and it makes Cal really angry at her for this reason that she's killing people who don't need to die. And they're part of the problem because they're part of the system, but they're just following orders. They're not the ones who are in charge of any of the things that are happening. They're just going along with it because of what they know. They discover like when they arrive at the prison too that Alara, the queen, is there. And so right as they're like leaving, they're outside, Alara is like coming at them and Shade is like teleporting people to this jet back and forth to like get everybody out faster and Mare is like calling upon a lightning storm because she's gonna lightning strike Alara and Ptolemus is there and he's like fighting stuff and what happens is Ptolemus throws a needle point of like metal basically towards Mare but Shade happens to teleport there at like the exact second so it hits him like directly in the heart and he's dead and then we like flash forward to when they're on the jet and Alara is also dead. They have her corpse with them on the plane. She got electrocuted real bad. She's real dead. Everybody's kind of like mad at Mayor. Farley is like really upset and like yelling at her. Cal is mad because she like lost her morality and went crazy and killed a bunch of people. In the, in the early stages of Groot, I get why people would just yell at her and like blame her, but she's like, it wasn't my fault. Like I also lost my brother for like the second time because I already thought he was dead once before, but now he's actually dead. And then she goes and like commands Cal to like take them back to talk the island they were at at the beginning of the book. And he's like, what about all of these new blood kids that we left at the notch? Like what? And she's like, you can go back for them, but I need to go to the colonel. And Cal's all like mad at her. He's like, why are you so suddenly power hungry? Why are you so like much of a savage killer now? Like what? You just want to go and shove the queen's corpse in the colonel's face to like show him up and say, ha ha, look what I did. And Mary's like, no, I want to go there so that we can make a broadcast and show that the queen is dead and it's because of the scarlet guard and to call everybody to action and like basically start a civil war and he's like oh dang so they end up going to tuck and this is and that happens the colonel is there he sees the queen's body they make the broadcast blah de blah de blah Mare like can't face her family because she feels like Shade's death is her fault and then Julian comes to her and he's like get it together you can't lose yourself in in all of this just because you've done all of these bad things you can't fall like deeper into this hole of becoming like this horrible person and she's like you're right I gotta at least try I got to apologize to a bunch of people I need to be better I like the idea of this character arc for her over the two books. She starts book one hating all Silvers because she's red and they're her oppressors. And then she gets into this situation where she's in the Silver world and she gets to know the Silvers and she's personally attached to them. And she can see that people like Julian are nice and understanding and they don't think that they should be better than the red so things become more complex about her feelings towards 
the silvers and then when people are killed at the Hall of the Sun like attack she feels really guilty about it because she doesn't think these people should die but that it's like for the greater good of the Scarlet Guard and then she continues to fall down into this hole she gets like the list and then she's obsessed with this list and she's like this list is the answer like the new bloods are the answer this is how we're going to revolt this is how we're going to win the new bloods are always the priority and she gets called out on it a couple times and she falls into it and then again she's like st goes into like anybody she doesn't know anybody who's part of anything bad in the silver world she's like killing she she like loses her morality and her humanity, but then she gets it back like real quick. I kind of wish we like did a bit more with that. But she goes back to her family finally and they're all like mad at her because she wasn't there before. And they're all like passive aggressive about like, you had things to do because you're the head of the rebellion or whatever, it's fine, we understand. And she's all like, no, I should have been here. And then they like end up immediately like forgiving her. Mary, her family, buries shade on the island of Tuck. She tells her family how she's going to be leaving again because her and the colonel have this plan to save the Little Legion, which is the 13 and the 16 year olds who are sent to the choke, the war front to like be killed. And her two brothers, Bree and Tranny, are like, we're going with you, no way we're not. So that's a thing. Then before the big meeting for this mission, the colonel takes Mare down to Barracks 1 where she meets these twins who are from a country that's pretty far away that we don't really know much about, that they are new bloods as well, though they don't call themselves that. I think they call themselves like Aarons or Orins or something like that. And these twins have the ability to like share basically like one line so they keep finishing each other's sentences. The scene in general felt like really out of place but I'm assuming it must come around back to the major plot at some point which is why I'm mentioning it. But they basically say our country is great, all of the people like us are like we're not murdered, we're held to really high esteem and we're really well respected. Come like lead a army mayor and we'll take all of the new blood refugees and keep them safe in our country and mayor is like take the people but like no way i don't want to lead nothing anymore like i'm done with leading things i'm over it that's a scene that happens and then they go on their mission so they're on the plane and cal is going on the mission and killer is going on the mission and Merit's there obviously for once farley staying behind because again, it is suggested that she is pregnant, but it is not stated. Again, they're on the plane and Mare's like freaking out on the plane because there's all these rides happening. She's like, oh my God, what have I done? But because she's all like electrifying, it's like causing the jet to do weird stuff. And Cal's like, whoa, girl, you need to calm down. But then while that's happening, plane blows up. Not because of Mare though, she doesn't blow up the plane. No, Maven blew up the plane. So they're captured, okay? They were falling through the sky, but then they weren't falling through the sky because silver powers. And then they were all chained up. And then Maven was gonna like kill them. She's like, Maven, don't kill Cal. Don't kill everybody. For some reason, she like offers Maven a trade, even though she is like in no position to be doing so. Like she's literally in a cage. Shade is no longer around to teleport us out of literally every situation. Like what leverage do you have? None. So she offers a trade to Maven because he, as we know, is obsessed with Mare and wants her back. And so she says, take me, but like let everybody else free. And then Maven agrees for some reason, even though he literally could have just kept everybody, but okay. So then Mare is imprisoned and she has like that clicking machine is there. So she like has no senses and is in pain constantly, but like she's not dying because they adjusted the levels or whatever. And then the book ends where she's being transported out of her little prison cell and she gets like paraded in front of a group of people in the square of the capital Archeon and then Maven literally puts a collar and a leash on her and it's like new and like that's where the book ends so there you have it I have to say I did like this book more than the first I felt like it was better there was yet another scene in which I was bothered by school like there's a point when they're at the notch 
where Killorn is being taught to read and write by some of the other new bloods. But that doesn't make any sense because we know from before and other statements that he was at school with Mayor until they were like eight. So clearly that was multiple years of school. And you're telling me he was at school for that long and he never learned to read or write anything? Ever? What is happening at these schools? The world building is really lacking and it's really weak and it's a big problem in the series because I think it has the potential to be quite good if all of these holes weren't in it. If you're somebody who really likes a lot of world building, you're probably not going to like this series. If you're somebody who can like really easily look over that and you're just here for like a fun time with some YA character drama and stuff, like go for it, try it out. You might like it more than, than I did. Not that I didn't like it. I ended up giving it, bumping it up to a 3.5. I was giving it a 3.25, but then I remembered how much I just really enjoy like a heist or like a break-in plan scene and the prison break really gave that to me. And so because I just love heists as an element in a story, I gave it more points maybe than it deserves. But you know, that's why it's my opinion and that's subjective ratings. I have honestly no idea where the story is going next. So that's kind of fun. We're gonna be starting book three, King's Cage. I'll see you with a new update. I'm back. I have read about a quarter of King's Cage at this point. I really didn't know if I wanted to come and film yet because it feels like both a lot has happened but also nothing and I'm gonna be honest with you, I don't really remember the order of everything because it all kind of feels the same. It feels like we're in a cycle a little bit, not gonna lie, but let's get into it, shall we, shall we? Just like with Glass Sword, we're, we're moving right along. We're at the exact moment that the last book ended, so Mare is being broadcasted to the world by Maven from this, from the square in the capital as a prisoner. She sees John, you know, like the weird guy who could see the future. He's there and she's like, he's, he's the one who betrayed us because he must now be on Maven's side. And so Mare's there in this collar, which has like, they call them like thorns. So there's like metal spikes on the inside that could like cut her skin on a leash in front of the whole world and Maven claims she's the leader of the Scarlet Guard during this, which is not true. One thing about Maven, he's gonna lie to the world. Then Mara's just like made a prisoner, but like she's kind of like not in a cell. Like she's just in like this room that's really bland, but it's like really nice. And she's just like hanging out in there. Not like that nicely because she's always watched by like a bunch of Arvin guards. Arvin is like the last name of the family who has silencing abilities. She's always like without her abilities in this room, but the bathroom only has silent stones, so at least she got some privacy. And she's just like there for a month. She's just in this room by herself for a month with no contact with like anybody. Because Maven was like, she deserves worse than death, so we're not gonna kill her. But Mare's kind of like, mm, I just don't think Maven can kill me. Like, I don't think he got that in him. I don't think he wants me dead because, as we know from his little noty notes, being all, I miss you until we meet again. This is all for you. Come back for me, Mare. He's kind of like, he's kind of obsessed. Like, in a not healthy way. Man needs to let it go. Like, she's gone, boy. You're not getting her back, even if she's a prisoner. Definitely not if she's a prisoner. So eventually one day like Evangeline comes by and she's all like I'm here because Mare was summoned by the king and the guards are like mm, We weren't told that and Evangeline who's now the betrothed of Maven So she's still gonna become queen, but like mm, there's no date on that like this is Doesn't really seem like that's happening anytime soon and she's kind of mad about it because she wants to be queen like right now like, if there's a king, and she's betrothed to the king, then why ain't she queen? She's been making crowns. 
the guards aren't gonna really say no to her, so Mare is taken, and she's brought in front of Maven during a party with all of these silvers. And because, you know, Evangeline's a little trickster trickster, she did this on purpose because she wants Mare treated like crap. And she's like, Mare's been treated too nicely. Like, why haven't we had her interrogated by a whisper, you know? Like, Alara's family people who can just, like, read people's mind and control them? Like, why isn't she being interrogated? Like, why hasn't that happened yet? And, like, what we know is that, like, Maven, like, in his sick way, cares about Mare, so he doesn't want her interrogated. But, like, also in my mind, I was like, mm, if she's interrogated, they might find out some stuff that maybe don't want them to find out. But then he does have her interrogated, and Samson does it, and he's, like, really cruel about it, and makes her, like, relive all of her worst moments, like, of her brother dying over and over again. But then also sees, like, see other things, like Cal killing his father. But here's the thing. If he saw Cal killing his father, wouldn't he also be able to see... The entire preamble to that, where Alara literally like admits that she's controlling the king, and that like they're like, wouldn't that, wouldn't they figure that out? Apparently, he just skipped over that part of her mind. Okay, whatever. We're moving past that. So he's all real mean about it, and finds out all of her stuff and about the Scarlet Guard. But what we find out, like, before this, because there's actually now two POVs, which I'm not shocked by because otherwise we're just stuck with Mayor in the castle and you don't know anything else that's going on. But I did find shocking is that the other point of view is Cameron, the new blood silencer from the last book that we, like, barely know. I'm kind of like, why isn't it Cal? Just because if we're doing the whole romance thing, which I can see is still going on, the whole romance thing would be built upon better if you have the POV of both people in, in the romance plot. And Cal is also with the Scarlet Guard, but is also like an outsider of the Scarlet Guard while being in it because he has no other interests. Like, again, I just feel like Cal could be a really interesting character. I'd like to be in his head, but nowhere in Cameron's. Okay. So the Scarlet Guard has moved. Because they're like, the second Mare was captured, they're like, she knows about talk, we're leaving. Wrap it up, on the jet, here we go. We're gone. So they're in a new place, and it's like underground, it's like in tunnels or something. It's, it's What's it called? There's like a name, they have a name for it. Irabelle? Why do I want to say Irabelle? But that sounds like both correct and incorrect. Moving on, they're in this underground place, and they're like keeping track of like, as much of Mare as they can because like Cal obviously is like wants to save her but like there's no like good way to go about that that will be successful they've just been kind of lying low I have finally I do have an answer to one of my questions though from this okay we discover that Cal is over in this empty tunnel by himself with a secret room that has a radio in it so we do know that people are communicating through radio as before, remember, I had the question, how are these people communicating to each other? They are radios. Like, I knew there was a radio system on the jets and, like, the airfield, but I didn't know if that, like, extended outside of that. Also, potentially, they are using, like, some kind of fax machine because the colonel is, like, receiving messages, like, they're printing out. They have completely battery-powered jets, but they're using a fax machine in this world? Okay. <laughs> Seems weird, but whatever. Do they also have dial-up internet? So that's what, like, the Scarlet Guard be up to while Mare's over there being, you know, a prisoner. She then, like, wakes up back in her cell after her interrogation, and, like, Maven is, like, there, like, visiting her, and it's, like, kind of weird, kind of creepy why are you watching her sleep and when she wakes up she got these fancy new carved just for her cuffs of like silent stone on each of her wrists and each of her legs and she's like well damn this sucks not fun and maven is like look we interrogated your mind there and we know that the scarlet guard tried to lock you up so you ran away and you came to us you came to me 
to be rescued. And she's like, that liar be lying real hard. But honestly, I gotta applaud the lie. The lie is good. Congrats, but also I hate you. So Maven is like, and that's what we're gonna tell the world. You're gonna tell the world that. And then you're gonna tell the new bloods that the Scarlet Guard is gonna try and kill them, but we will give them refuge so they should come to us. And Mayor is like, why would I do that? I'm not gonna do that. And he's like, if you don't, I'm just gonna keep killing all the new bloods instead. Ah! So Mayor's like, damn, I'm gonna have to go along with this plan. I don't like it. Nah, uh. So she's like, I gotta escape, and I gotta escape, like, today. So she has this plan. She's been collecting, like, shards of metal and glass and things that she's been keeping under her little bunk. And she, like, has this escape plan where she, like, goes into the bathroom. She actually has privacy, and she, like, starts, like, flooding the place, knowing that the guards will come a-running. And when they do, she drops the chandelier that she's unscrewed from the ceiling because she's in a fancy place and not a cell, there's a chandelier. And it falls in the water and it electrocutes them. So they're like, oh, I'm cold. And, she, and so then she's like in her heavy little stone cuffs being like, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running away. But she's not gonna get very far, let's be honest. She does not get very far and she's captured again and then she brought back. I really don't understand why this is part of the story. What did we gain from this? Oh, I guess maybe we gain one thing. When she's captured, she's captured by Sonia Iral, who is the granddaughter of the panther, who was in the Koros prison, and then Ptolemus murdered her. So Mayor is like, I saw your grandma. She was at the prison. She was murdered by Ptolemus. And Sonia is like, you can tell she's like, wanted Mary to tell her this information and she's like mad about it but she has to pretend you know because cameras are everywhere we're being watched the whole point of the entire escape thing is just to like put this doubt and this anger towards maven in some in the silvers a little bit i guess anyway the broadcast happens where mary's like she's put in like this dress that covers all of her silent stone things and then also she has like a an m like burned into her like neck collarbone area by maven that so she's been like branded by him so the dress is also covering that and she makes this announcement to the world on the television and of course the scarlet guard people are watching and they're like <gasps> How dare she say that? And then Kilona is like, you think she wanted to? You think she's up there willingly saying this? Like, are you dumb? And Cal is like, real man. And then Farley is like, you know what else we learned from this? Because Maven is like, calling the morale of the soldiers in Corvium. We know that Corvium ain't in a good place. We know they're still rioting. So, and we know that the reds are turning on the silvers there and that they outnumber them. Like we should, we should place an attack on that city and then, you know, make a statement. Say, we're still here. We're doing the war. We're gonna win. And that happened like a while ago, honestly. Like there's like four mayor chapters to every Cameron chapter. So honestly, I really don't know what's happening. <laughs> back with the scarlet guard after that like that was it seems like a really long time ago in the book now and i i have no updates on on that portion no idea what's going on so after that mayor is like dressed up kind of like every day and like paraded around and she's on the broadcast all the time that these new bloods keep showing up and then one day the new bloods are there and they have to like prove their powers to get this like asylum refugee help from maven whatever and this one has the ability to tell what everybody's abilities are. And so she is, you know, going through, listing what everybody be, and gets to one person who's an IRAL, who, so they should be a swift, and says they have the ability to change their face. And then Mayor's like, no, 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 no. 
and it turns out that it's Nanny from the Scarlet Guard, and she's captured, and they're like, we're going to interrogate her, but before they can, she takes a pill so that the Scarlet Guard remains safe. And Mayor's, like, really mad at this because she knows the only person who would try to actually, like, break her out of, like, her capture from Maven would be Cal, and she's, like, kind of mad that he's, like, sacrificing people. But obviously, I feel like they weren't forced to do anything. Anyway, she's mad about it. She's upset. She, like, rips up a bunch of books, and then the next day, they're replaced by a bunch of Julian's books which she knows is like a gift from Maven as like an apology for what he did to Nanny because like there's this thing where like he cares about Mare in this really like nasty way where he has to be mean to her but like he doesn't want to be but he it, it's it's strange it's cool honestly Maven is the most interesting part of this book series what happens then? Oh, we're visited by two princes from Piedmont. We discover that Piedmont is run by a number of different princes together. And so two of them are visiting and they want to interrogate Mare. And Maven's like, we can do it, but like only right here and you have to keep the silent stone on. And so when she has the silent stone on, not only does it stop her abilities, but it also stops others' abilities to be used on her. All they can do is just like ask her questions and they're like, What's up with the Scarlet Guard? Where are they? Where's their money coming from? Are they in Piedmont? And she's like, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And they're like, um, what do you mean you don't know? Aren't you their leader? And she's like, no. But they're just like, mm, she's probably lying to us. Okay. And from this, we discover that there's like a prince and a princess that are like missing from Piedmont. So it seems like the Scarlet Guard are in action and they're potentially capturing people over in uh, other countries. Maybe it's not guaranteed, but that's what I'm that's that's the vibe I'm getting is that we are kidnapping people. Then there's a banquet and we're at the banquet. Okay, and John's at the banquet. Creepy John is there, sitting next to Mayor, who's sitting next to Evangeline. We also discover that in like we'll get there. Evangeline and like and Sonia are like real close they're little besties you know they're like really close this is what sense before they're like really close and then at the banquet there's an assassination attempt on Maven and a bunch of the silver houses including Irel which is Sonia's house like turns there's like three of them that are like attacking the others and some escape, some are captured. Maven has like a bullet in his neck. He's like gargling blood. It's a lot. John runs away because he saw this coming. And then so he's like, uh, Mayor? And then just like bolts out of the room. And Mayor's like, I should run and escape during all of this chaos. But she, she's captured again. She doesn't even get out of the room. And then so Maven, of course, is saved because healers exist. But one of the princes is dead. And so afterwards, they're like, you know, in another room, Maven was almost dead like two minutes ago, but now he's like, mm, I'm totally cool, totally fine. You tried to kill me, but it didn't work. <laughs> you can't kill me. And during this, he is like interrogating all the other people, having Samson interrogate them. And he's like, do you know where they went, Evangeline? Sonia was like your really best friend. And she's like, why would I pot I'll possibly know? And then it's like very like clearly hinted that like her and Sonia were like sleeping together. So I guess Evangeline is part of the queer community we love. But also it feels really like out of the blue. Guess, guess that's there now. Did anything else happen? Honestly, I feel like more should have happened. Like, that doesn't feel like a lot of things who have happened in, like, 130 pages that I've read. Like, also, what is the Scarlet Guard doing? Like, why am I reading so much about Mare just, like, sitting in a room and feeling conflicted about Maven? We also discover that Maven, he's made all of his thrones and, like, chairs made out of silent stone so that none of the whispers can, like be speaking in his mind so that he can be sure he's making all of his own decisions which is very interesting for his character to see that he really doesn't know 
which of his thoughts are his own and what parts of him and his opinions are his own and what's his mother and other people influencing him. So he's very conflicted about that. We get this story once when he's with Mare about how he was like late to start walking as a child and what his mother did was like infiltrate his little baby mind and forced him to walk until he did it by himself. Which if it's real that is hella messed up. And if it's a lie, that's hella messed up. All we can see is that Maven clearly is very conflicted about both about like basically everything he thinks. He doesn't know what's his own thoughts. And so he's sitting on silent stone and repressing his own abilities all the time just so that other people can't be whispering in his mind so that he knows every decision he makes is his own decision and not somebody else's. Really intriguing. I really like that. Maven is the best character in the book. Tell me I'm wrong. He's actually becoming a complex villain. I wanted this. I felt like he was going to down the big bad road, but he's come back and he's now complicated and I like it. I like it. I guess that's where we are. She's just living with, with stone cuffs and hating it. That's, that's what it's been, it feels like it's been for her for like all of these pages. Like, she's- girl's really doing nothing. She's decided that she needs to, like, escape herself, and her plan is to just, like, can put doubt into a bunch of silver mines by just, like, talking and hoping for the best, I guess. I know my complaint with all of the other books has been that the plot's been moving too fast, but this- this is not what I wanted. I didn't want us to just stalemate into- into this, where we're just- living day by day the exact same day like i want to get a bit more of what happening over at the scarlet guard because i'm really bored of reading about mare being sad in her fancy bed prison we're back i've read more <laughs> of king's cage i honestly i don't know how much i'm over halfway through the book now so i have about a hundred pages i think left and honestly again this whole book feels like like a lot has happened and then when I actually think about it, I'm like, hmm, I actually think nothing has happened this entire novel. There's so much that is just really repetitive. What has happened since <laughs> since I last read? It's a mystery. It's a blur. <laughs> Do I remember? I honestly had to make a bunch of notes to get the plot straight. I have a very good memory. <laughs> I I pride myself on having a good memory. And I could not remember the order of these plot points. I was writing things down and then like bouncing back and forth because I was like, did that happen before this? Did this? Because it doesn't feel like a lot of the things in the plot are actually well connected. And they don't really, in my mind, they don't like flow into each other. Like there's no cause and effect between the plot. It all just like happens. It makes it confusing to my mind. I believe we end off post assassination attempt on Maven. One of the Piedmont princes is dead, so now Piedmont naturally is mad and angry and uh, leaves. Makes sense. I think I also said how Evangeline had Sonya as a lover, I think, but that's wrong. It's actually Elaine. Elaine the shadow, so she can make herself invisible. That's the one that is with Evangeline. So, correction, my apologies. After the assassination attempt, we go back to Mare, just like sitting in her room with her little shackles on. She's reading books. She then mentions school yet again because she's reading all these history books and discovering the history of Norda. And she mentions school. She mentions school! And she talks about how, in her head, obviously it's first person but she says how like at school they learned about the old gods again and it, there's no religion there's no religion in Nordatha so why are we talking about the old gods 
And then she goes on to say how it makes sense because the Silvers want to keep the Reds uneducated so that they can control them. But the Silvers wanted to keep the Reds uneducated. Do you know what they would do? Maybe, perhaps, not have school. Then again, it's at this point, it feels like Mayor potentially is the only person to have ever gone to school in this entire world. So, who knows? It is the rage that keeps on raging inside me. It's almost three full books now, and it continues to be mentioned over and over again. I don't know why this continues to be happening. Anyway, Mayor also now is apparently amazing at playing mind games. She's spending a bunch of time with Maven, and she's all like plotty plotty in her head, and she's all like, I'm going to say the exact right thing to get under his skin. And I'm like, girl, where did you learn this ability? Because last time I checked, you're only good at being stubborn and speaking your mind even when you're not supposed to and that getting you in trouble. So why are you suddenly like this like master of language? <laughs> Where'd that come from? I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. Was it in the book about school? So during one of her little mind gamey sessions with Maven, we discovered that Maven is bisexual. Again, not actually stated, it's just like assumed based off of the reaction of Mare that the Thomas, the red that in the first book Maven claimed he saw die at the war front, Maven says that he was like, his friend and he really cared about him and that he actually didn't die like in the war. A lot of this book is like I'm reading things and I'm like I read these words and I don't know what they mean. Like they're English, I know what they're saying but it's like mm, unclear. Instead of dying at the war front because they say he wasn't a soldier, which then okay even more so why was Thomas there? He was 17 and he was not a soldier. Why was he there? Where did he come from? Not explained. Mystery Thomas. But Thomas died because he burned when Maven couldn't. I think it's like implied that Maven was young and he like lost control of his power, so he burned down a place and Thomas died. And then Mare is like, he loved Thomas the way he loved me. Again, that leaves us with the impression that, okay, Maven is bisexual. And again, I am perfectly fine. Like, I can see that. It feels like this was like just sprinkled in and not ingrained in Maven's identity. It feels like we got to book three and we were like, mm, there's no queer rep, let me just... I'm hoping that this will be worked into it more and worked into Maven's character more and Evangeline's character more to solidify that so that it doesn't just feel like a little token sprinkle on top of the candy bar candy bar who put sprinkles on a candy bar you get what i'm saying i'm hoping that it's not just there to like give the author brownie points for having a queer rep all of a sudden and that it was actually thought through because i don't really see it being placed at all in the previous two books and either of these characters who are now identified by other people and not themselves to be queer we find out that great Maven go, decides to go on, on a coronation tour and he brings Mare. They go on a train. Maven has a train now. So they go on their tour and they're like hopping all around. And Maven's doing his little speech speeches. Fine and dandy, whatever. We get back to the Scarlet Guard. And this is like potentially the only chapter that we get from Cameron that is actually useful to any part of the plot. Like, all of the other chapters we've gotten from her has just been her being like mad and then us getting information that's about Mare and could have been told from Mare's point of view. Like we have not really learned anything <laughs> about what's actually going on there. Like those, all of those chapters have felt pointless. At least this one has some substance, though it doesn't seem to be affecting the Mare side of the plot much. The Scarlet Guard does attack Corvium and they take it for the most part, but Corvium's built in like little rings so all the silvers that are left have like locked themselves in the innermost tower circle column thing and so now cal and the colonel are like did you want me to do no did you want me to do angry angry and then they learn that the silvers 
I actually have the little legion, like the 15, 16 year olds who were conscripted the war, but then while Maven was on his coronation tour, he was like, that's what's the mistake, the conscription age is brought up again, but then the little legion are like still in the war, so. Hypocrisy. So they discovered that the little legion's in there, so then Cameron, being Cameron, is like, I'm gonna go and attack all of the silver single-handedly because my brother is in there because she refuses to have a single brain cell. Her personality, her entire character is just like, I'm, I'm mad, I hate the silvers. So Farley stops her and she's like, look, we'll instead, we'll break them out. We got a plan. And they get the, the, the red, the new blood, who can like make illusions for people so they see things that aren't actually there. I don't remember his name. It's not Gareth. Gareth is the one that flies, right? Herrick? Is it Herrick? We'll go with Herrick. Why not? Him and Cameron, they make, he's all illusioning them so it looks like they're not there and then they find the little legion and then they illusion their way out. Cameron like sees a bunch of silvers who are dead and dying and like feels bad for a second. She's like, I have humanity? And then she like kills a couple and she like kind of feels a little bad about it. She's going through the exact same character development that Mary did in the first book. Can you stop? Can you stop? Like... That chapter ends with her brother basically being scared of the Scarlet Guard to show how like him and the Little Legion have been corrupted to believe the lies that Maven is saying. We haven't had another Scarlet Guard perspective Cameron POV since, so I don't know anything outside of that. Mare figures out that Maven's little coronation tour is actually going up to the war front. And so they actually stop by in a place that's like near Corvium and they find out about the Scarlet Guard attacking Corvium, but then again, they don't do anything and they just move on. So why, why did that whole Scarlet Guard chapter happen? If it seems like it didn't affect anything. I don't understand why they need to be on screen. I feel like they wanted to just show that the Scarlet Guard has taken a city and so they're claim starting like a war, that they could have just like said that. Like it almost, it didn't need to be seen because it feels so insubstantial. So they end up going to the war front and what happens is Maven meets with the Lakelanders who are the people they're at war with and they end the war, they make a treaty. How many hammers do you have up there? He agrees to marry the Lakelander princess in order to end the war and then Evangeline is seen storming out, but the mayor's like, she seems relieved. Hint, hint. But then we like go back to the capital, and then Mayor is still living her life where she's locked up in her shackles and she's reading books. Like, this book could have been good if we didn't spend half of it just like reading books with Mayor in a room. Because I feel like a lot of what is happening is actually interesting, but there's so much just boring ass stuff in it that I can't. I, I can't care about the good things happening. The wedding happens and Mare is like basically a bridesmaid with Evangeline or something. Like they're both like just like holding the princess's train the whole time. It's weird. I don't know why Evangeline's doing it. I understand that maybe makes Mare do it so that like he can keep an eye on her because again, he's like obsessed with Mare. The wedding happens and then there's like an attack on the wedding and it's the Scarlet Guard and people are dying and it's chaos and it's like, oh, wow. Well, and the Maven's like running to his train. And for some reason, Evangeline comes and like saves Mare. Like she unlocks her little shackles and has a healer there to like to heal her from the silent stone that's been on her for like ever. It's just like, it's so confusing and I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense. Her, her one bargaining chip was like, don't kill my brother. Okay. She finds Cal. But Cal is being controlled by Samson, the little whisper guy who's all mean and evil. Every time, like, one of Cal or Merrick get close to Samson, he controls the other one to attack them. But then they end up just killing him anyway. It was a messy fight scene. It wasn't really written out in a way that was clear to follow, but that's the result of it. They end up escaping because there's a, there's a new teleporting red. She died, but then we brought a new one back, so I don't know if that's going to become a new important character so that we can continue to escape all situations because we have someone who can teleport. Then for some reason we have a chapter from Evangeline's point of view. We are hundreds of pages into this book. And we're now just getting her point of view out of nowhere for one chapter. The Samos family is like, they're running. Like, they're running away. They're like, mm, 
we gotta get out of here. Maven's crazy. She's like waiting for Ptolemus. Ptolemus comes. He's lost a hand. Hand gone. But they escape anyway, and then they're on a boat, and then they discover that basically their whole family is running away, and the plan is that her father, the Lord, he controls an area of Norita called the Rifts, and he plans on basically making himself king and creating his own kingdom and just like separating that from Norita. That's the plan. So Maven now has even more enemies, and that's where we are. I think I dislike this book so much because I can see how I could like it because a lot of it is really interesting insight into like Maven as a character especially and like the politicking and stuff like I like that in books but it just is covered so much with this stupid cotton candy fluff of like Mare reminiscing about school and reading books in a room for days and days and days that I don't get it like at least she's escaped now so like she can't be locked in a room reading books for like hundreds of pages I don't know if we're gonna get more of Evangeline's point of view. If Mare's back with the Scarlet Guard, are we now not gonna have Cameron's point of view? Who knows, maybe it'll turn around, it'll be amazing, and I'll love the end, and it'll be great. We'll see. I'm expecting a twist, because Miss Victoria Aviard loves to do a little 360 degree turn at the end of every book she writes, so stay tuned. Hello, hi, hello. I have finished King's Cage, so. Let's, let's just finish this out. Honestly, I feel like not that much happened in the last 100 pages and it was kind of disappointing, not gonna lie. Like I didn't hate it, but I was a little disappointed because I was expecting there to be like a big shocking twist at the end and there wasn't. I also feel like there could have been, but Miss Victoria Avier ruined it for herself. Like she stole the shock away. What happened in the last little bit is that we are back with Mare. She has just escaped from the wedding attack, right? For some reason, the teleporting people can teleport into jets. So they can somehow teleport into moving objects that are moving extremely fast through the sky. I don't know how this ability works, but I feel like that doesn't make sense. So they end up going to Piedmont. That's the place that has all the princes that went to visit Maven, right? So apparently the like the head prince. So wouldn't that just make him a king? He's he's like the the head guy in charge of all of the other people with basically the same role. He's like under the control of the Scarlet Guard because the Scarlet Guard stole his children. So the Scarlet Guard is just hanging out in Piedmont, being like. Hey, look at us on our fancy military base in Piedmont. <laughs> and uh, while we're there, what happens? Basically, there's a meeting. Mare tells them everything that happens. There we discover that like Montfort is also here and they're like heavily involved with the guard. We meet the premier of Montfort who's like a red who escaped Northa years ago and now he's like, you know, runs the country. Farley is now part of command. There's really no explanation behind how that happens. She just like literally shows up to the meeting and then the colonel is like, you're not authorized to be here. And then she has hands on a piece of paper and she's like, yeah, I am because I'm command now. And that's it. Also, Mare finds out that Farley is pregnant because she's heavily pregnant. And I'm like, girl, how did you not know that from like, because I know she hasn't seen her since, you know, six months ago when they were like burying shade but like Farley was all like holding her stomach and like saying how she's not making decisions just for her anymore it was like very obvious it was very obvious Mare is just blind to it all so she's all like oh. Oh. Mare starts like training again because she's all like I no longer have a purpose she's just hanging out in Piedmont right she's like mm. Let's see, I'm no longer a spy, I'm no longer trying to save new bloods, I'm no longer trying to escape Maven, like, what am I supposed to do? Her and Cal are all, like, in love. They, like, have sex for the first time, but it's, like, in the woods, in the mud, and literally afterwards they're, like, covered in mud. I'm like, girl, that just doesn't sound like a good time. No! No! Just no! That sounds horrible! <laughs> Farley has her baby. Its name is Clara. After her mother, it looks like Shade. I feel like we're just at Piedmont for like a while. She meets a bunch of 
by a bunch, I mean three other people who have the same power as her. Their lightning is different colors. Like, hers is purple, and then there's, like, one Ella, who has, like, blue lightning, and, like, Rafe, who has green lightning, and then Titan, who has white lightning. And for some reason, the rest of them like to dye their hair the color of their lightning. Unexplained why. She's all, like, training with them. She's getting better and stuff, because these people actually know her power, blah, 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 blah. I think we have, like, another point of view from Cameron. Again, I don't understand the points of view from Cameron. They make no sense. Why are they there? It's like her and her brother. She's all like, I don't want to kill because of my power. I don't want to be a monster. Conflict, conflict. But again, like, we don't have enough of her character to, like, actually... It doesn't do much. Like, I don't care about her because we only have, like... There was, like, four chapters from her point of view in the entire book, maybe. We also get another Evangeline POV. We get two more from her, I think. And then the first one, it's like, she's at her house, which is, I guess, now a palace because they're now a kingdom and she's now a princess. And then they have, like, this meeting with a bunch of people. Cal's grandmother shows up. We, we like, discover that Evangeline let Mare go because Cal's mother agreed to side with the Samoses if they freed Mare because... Cal was communicating with his grandma. Remember that radio room? Remember the secret radio room that Cal had like 200 pages ago that felt like it was going to be significant, but we never heard about it again? Apparently, he was talking to his grandma and he was like, All I want is Mare. And so his grandma got Mare free and she told the Samuels that they like, they like, free Mare and I'll be on your side. And then they all like plot and scheme Evangeline's father and Cal's grandmother in this moment that Evangeline will still marry Cal and he'll take the place of Northa's king from Maven because he's the true king and the grandma's already been talking with Montfort and the Scarlet Guard and they agree to back that so that's you know common enemy thing with Maven being the enemy. I don't understand why he was there. We'll get there. We'll get there. I didn't like it. Randomly one day in Piedmont because we're hanging out in Piedmont remember and we find out that Corvium, the military city that the Scarlet Guard now has because they stole it, they like fought their way and they won it, right? So it's now them, but that's going to be under attack by Maven. And so they find out it's under attack and they are all like flying in. Those chapters, like those couple of chapters I actually really liked. I thought that was interesting when we were fighting, the big fight, because we've never seen anything that's like battle and how more like war style fighting is done by these people with abilities you've kind of only seen like one-on-one -on -one fighting for the most part they end up winning they're fighting it's looking bad but they're like doing okay then the, like the samos and the other people that he has on his side show up evangeline makes his comment being like he has to save you again i thought i told you not to make this a habit about like saving there and then it just like cuts to like the next scene like we don't get to see the end of the battle we just told that they won and then they have like a big meeting with all the people garlic guard and montford and uh samos and them they're all like having a little chit chat they reveal that they're gonna try and put cal to as the king and he's gonna marry evangeline and they're gonna be you know tied together forces but cal didn't know about this and mayor didn't know about this and for some reason this scene is told from the point of view of evangeline who also doesn't want this the only thing we get from her point of view is the fact that her life is not her own because of her status as like a high reigning family that she never makes gets to make her own decisions and being with the woman she loved is like not an option for her but the thing is that if we didn't have that scene from evangeline's point of view earlier where we find out this plan that Lord Samos and Cal's grandmother made together, then we would be discovering that in this scene and we'd actually think it was shocking and a twist. Like we actually would have been like, oh, but like we all knew it was coming and we all, we all knew that. And then because we had that scene before too, we also know that like Cal's grandma and like Lord Samos are lying when they're saying that they believe in like a more equal world. And I think it would have been more interesting if we got that without the previous information and from not Evangeline's point of view. So it was more so we don't know if they're lying, but we know that they're deceitful. I feel like that would have been more fun. 
So I felt a little disappointed because I was expecting a big twist. Now, Mare's all like, Cal, choose me. And Cal's like, Mare, choose me. And then they're like separate. So they were just together. They finally got together. And now they're gone because Cal thinks he can be a good king. And like he was like made to be the king. So he's not going to turn down being the king. Okay, okay, cool, 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 cool. But I wish that I was shocked by that because I'm not. It was just kind of boring. I'm giving this one also a 3.5. Thinking about it, I feel like now I should have given Glass Sword lower. Maybe I should bump Glass Sword down to at least a 3.25. Maybe I, maybe I shall do that. And Because I do think this one was better than Glass Sword because of the character development. But also, any point of view that was not Mare's was completely unnecessary because any information we found out in those chapters, they either were already things that we could have found out if we just stayed in Mare's point of view, like the Scarlet Guard watching Mare on the TV. Like, we could have just been in Mare's point of view for that. We didn't really learn anything new. Or it just recaps what's already happened, like the end, where we just, like, everything's announced, and so it's like, why do we have Evangeline's point of view? Why do we care? I didn't feel like those point of views were necessary, and I feel like it kind of just cut up the story and made it a bit more confusing. Also, again, just pages upon pages of Mare sitting in a room, and I was so bored of it. I know I complained about the plot moving too fast in the previous two books, but like this book didn't have enough plot to be 400 pages. It could have been condensed. I think it would have worked better because overall when things actually happen, they still happen really, really fast. It's just that we had all of these lulls in between where Mara is just like reading a book in a room. <laughs> I don't get it. So I have one more book left. We're moving into War Storm. I'm hoping to read it in like the next two days, hopefully. Fingers crossed. Find out. Stay tuned. I, I just want this over with. Not in like, it's not that I'm having a bad time. There's just certain things that are making me angry. So I, I want to conclude this chapter of my life. <laughs> the way this book ended, I'm just not like itching to read the last book. But there's only one more book left, so obviously I'm going to read it. So here we go. Good morning, good morning. I just washed my hair so it is dry and full of gel. So just like ignore this. I've read like 370 pages of War Storm and have not updated you on it at all. But guys, it's because it's good. I'm really feeling like this is going to be a four star book to finish the series, which is exciting. Because before now, I've kind of just been like, eh, eh. It's okay, but I really feel like this book is good. I have two cups of tea and a glass of water, so let's get into this, okay? In this one, we have left the Cameron POV behind, which I'm happy about. And we have the point of view of Mare, Evangeline, and then Iris, who is the Lake Lander princess, who is now married to Maven. We're switching through those POVs pretty evenly, which I like. I feel like this was the mistake in the last book where it was basically mostly Mare's point of view. And so the other point of views didn't carry enough weight and also felt pointless to the plot. And also what, what has happened in this book is that the plot is connected through the POVs. So I actually feel like I actually remember what happens a bit more. We like it. We start yet again where we left off in the other book. So we're in Cordorium and they have just defeated Maven, Cal has decided to be the true king of Norta, and Mare is all like mad about that because she's, you know, Scarlet Guard and she doesn't want there to be a king in Norta. And so, you know, they're all like, it's over. They decide that there's now no point in having Corvium, so they raid it. You know, is it raiding if you control it? I don't know. But basically, they take anything of value and then, like, just blow the place up so it's brought to the ground it is ruins and then they just leave they're like okay we're gonna go on a little journey we're gonna go on a little trip okay to montfort because we need more soldiers but because they're a democracy we have to go in front of their council and like ask them because we can't just tell them to do it what is democracy on this trip is the premier and then Farley, obviously, because she's Scarlet Guard. 
And so Mare is going because Evangeline suggests it because she doesn't want to marry Cal and she just wants to live her own life. So she's plotting, she's plotting her own little plots back here, right? Because Mare's going, Cal is going because Evangeline knows that like Cal's still gonna follow Mare everywhere because he's like a little puppy in love even if he wants to be the king. And Mare doesn't want him to be a king because she doesn't want there to be no king. And then because Cal's going and Samos has declared the Rift their own kingdom, Evangeline's father is like, great, Evangeline can also go. Wonderful. That little group and then Julian and Annabelle, Cal's grandmother, is also going. So we have a fun little, you know, group going on a little adventure to Montfort to ask the government for some people to fight for our cause against Maven. They stop off in Piedmont and Mary's like, hey, family, you're gonna move to Montfort, but like only if you want to, but like I highly suggest it. And they're like, yeah, okay. So she takes her whole family and then she's like, hey, Killorn, do you wanna come? And he's like, yeah, why not? Cool, a trip. <laughs> I don't know why he goes. It doesn't really make a bunch of sense, but he's there. So they all go to Montfort. Well, they're at Montfort. They're like, have dinner. During the dinner, like alarms go off and it's like raiders. And basically we learn that in Montfort, there's silvers who didn't want to give up their status and their pride and didn't believe in this new world. So now they basically like live in rags and they just like raid the city to steal stuff to survive because they don't believe in democracy. <laughs> they all go to fight it because Cal is all noble He's like, I need to show that I'll fight for Montfort so they'll fight for me. They all go and they're like, boop, 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 do, do, fight, fight. But they get like caught, things happen, Farley's knee gets messed up, but nobody dies. Then we get this other point of view, which is Iris. And basically Iris, she's also like plotting her little plots behind the scenes, you know? Cause she's like, mm, Maven is like a, a nest boy. I don't, I don't like being around this. So I need to find a way out of this. And so what she decides with her mother, because her father had died at Corium, and so they're very mad about that because the Ural who was like under the command of Samos did it. Even though Samos didn't want him to do that, he didn't want him to kill the king of the lake lands because that really cuts any possible tie there for them for an alliance. And so they're her father is dead. We discover that in the Lake Lands there actually is religion, though they call their gods nameless gods, and that weirds me out a bit. I feel like the religion part of this whole book is really strange, because in Nordotha there is no religion, and through the Lake Lands having religion, we learn that they're very against religion, but then like in the previous books they've still talked about like praying and gods and the old gods, so like d did there used to be religion and now there's not? Like it's unclear. Unclear, but okay, there's nameless gods. They decide to plot, they're plotting. And they're like, look, Montfort stole the children of Piedmont. So if we have you, specifically Iris, rescue the children to get Piedmont on our side, but you are like the person who actually did it, we gain more favor than Maven does, even if you do it, you know, in the name of Nordatha. While everybody else is in Montfort, Iris is also in Montfort. And so they contacted the Silver Raiders to plan this little disturbance, this little distraction, so that everybody's out of the city so that they can hoppy hoppy in and steal the children back. And so they rescue the children, bring them back to the Piedmont prince. I don't know if he's a prince or a king, I don't remember. But how does Piedmont work? Yeah, Piedmont, Piedmont is the one with all the, all the princes. It's weird. We, why is everybody a prince in Piedmont? How is this guy the leader of Piedmont if he's also a prince? I don't understand. I'm confused. What are the delegations here? Then, what, what's the city they're called? It's like Ascendant. It's like, basically, it's like in a mountains. Who would have guessed that Montfort is full of mountains? I'm shocked. It's almost as shocking as prairie being a bunch of prairie lands. I can't believe it. Everybody, like the Cal Mayor Evangeline group, they go to the council, they ask for the troops, they get them, and then they're like, okay, cool, 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 because we don't want to fly over a bunch of enemy territory just to get to Piedmont, where we don't really need to be. We're going to go over to the Rift and to like Evangeline's father's place. We're going to hang out there because it's closer. They go there, and when they get there, they're like, oh! 
The Piedmont base has been attacked and taken over because Prince Bracken, the Piedmont guy who had his children stolen, but he then got his children stolen back. He turned on them because now he has his children back. And so Maven took it. Boop -a -doop -a -doop -a -doo. And there's a bunch of hostages. Upsetting. We also, you know, now have this scene where, remember the Mom Ford twins with their little mind connection? Guess what? They're triplets. Now what happens is they like took one with them and then left one in Mom Ford so that they could communicate. The third one is in Piedmont. And basically he got taken and captured during this little takeover of that base. And then so Mara talks to Maven through that guy and they tell them how the Scarlet Guard basically like placed bombs in the whole place. So if they don't release the prisoners, they're just gonna blow them up. And so they're like, mm, damn, guess we'll guess we'll do that. Maven's all like, ooh, I can tap the mirror through this new blood. And Mary's like, nah, if you keep this new blood, I'm still gonna blow you up. I'll do it. So they get all those people back and now they've abandoned Piedmont. And they're like, this is not fun. We've lost Piedmont and we've given up on Corvium. And Cal's grandmother's like, mm, Cal needs a capital because he can't be a king without a capital. It will be Delphi, the place that I own, the place that I already rule. It will be the capital. And Cal is like, no, absolutely not. That shows nothing. I already own that, everybody knows it. Like I need to prove a point. We are going to attack and take Harbor Bay and that will be my capital because it has Fort Patriot, which has the Navy, the Air Force and land army people. Like it got everything. Also that, was his mother's favorite place. So, you know, like sentimental value. We're gonna do a little three-pronged attack from every which way. We're gonna take Harbor Bay and that'll be like, mm, I own Harbor Bay now. Cool, this is my capital. Fun, fun, fun. And Mayor says, you know what we should do? And there you go, what Mayor? And Mayor says, we should attack Newtown and run it amok, take it over. We know the Reds there are gonna revolt. That's the techie slum. They're making stuff for Maven, so then he'll lose a bunch of resources because these people aren't gonna be making them for him anymore. They decide to do this on the same day. Mayor and the Premier and a bunch of Montfort people are going to attack Newtown with Cameron because she's back for like one scene. And Kilorn is going with them. And then the rest of them are going to be attacking Harbor Bay. But what we learn when we go back to Iris is that Maven has predicted this. He he knows his brother and he's a little he's a little mind trickster, right? He he can predict what he's gonna do because he knows him so well. He got the thoughts. He was trained for this by his creepy mom. And he goes, I know my brother is going to attack Harbor Bay, so what I'm gonna do, Iris, is I'm going to put you in Harbor Bay to defend it to ensure that your mom actually comes and supports me because otherwise mm, I guess you'll die. So sad. So when they get to Harbor Bay and they're attacking, the Newtown one basically goes fine. They run it over. Everything works as planned. Killorn almost dies, but he doesn't. So mm, inconsequential. So then Mayor is like, is everything going well in Harbor Bay? And they're like, mm, obviously, obviously not. And she goes, I have to go. I have to get to Harbor Bay. So basically when they're attacking, because we get Evangeline's point of view, she's doing the little the little water attack, right, on the bay. And they discover, they're like, mm, these nymphs that are nymphing right now with this water is much stronger than I expected it to be. And then they find out, oh, it's because Iris is here, the lake lander, the nymph queen. This is not good. So things are not going good. Things are not really not going good. Evangeline and Ptolemus, they almost die. And she's like, why would our father risk our lives like this? I'm hurt and offended, but they don't die. And then they're like regrouping, right? They're like, mm, this is not going well. I was basically trying to flood this whole place. And then Cal is like, you see those, their ships over there with the big guns? We're gonna aim those guns at Iris and we're gonna take her hostage. Actually, Cal doesn't say that. I think his grandmother suggests it and he's all against hostages, but like they don't really have another choice. 
So what happens is they teleport Evangeline and Thomas onto these ships to like lock the guns in place on Iris and then Cal teleports to the ship with Iris and he's like fighting Iris. And then Mare shows up and she's like, what's he doing? Fighting the nymph in the middle of the ocean when he hates water and water can very easily defeat him. Not fun. We don't like it. Basically ends Cal, like, falls into the ocean. He almost dies, but he doesn't. Mare has this moment where she's like, I'm panicking. I can't live without him. Oh. And Iris escapes. And she's all like, don't worry, Prince Maven. Even though we lost Harbor Bay, I, like, destroyed the whole port. So it'll take them forever to rebuild. And Maven's like, I see what you're doing, Iris. I know you, you're saying this to trick me, but I know that you actually did that so that if I got it back, I also don't have anything. There's no point in getting it back now. I'm losing, I see you, I see your little plotty plots. At this point, we actually get one chapter of Maven POV and one chapter of Cal POV, which felt a little weird. I like the Maven one more than the Cal because I feel like Maven had a stronger voice and also you kind of got some actual insight into his thinking and you find out that like his mother, he can still hear his mother like whispering in his head and he's like, I don't know if these are memories or if she somehow is still there. He's real, he's real suffering up there. You like kind of feel bad for him, but you don't because of like all of the nasty things he's done. With the cow one, you kind of just learn the things that we already know about him, which is that even though he loves Mare, he feels like he'd be betraying his like father and his country and everything he was like brought up to do and to love, you know, if he chooses her over this. And then we also discovered that Julian gave him his mother's old diary. This has not come up again yet, so I don't know what's going on there. Since Cal almost died, Evangeline's like, this is great. I can just use my little plotty plots to plot my way into getting Cal and Mare back together. And then hopefully I won't have to marry Cal because I really don't want to do that because I just want to be close to Elaine, the love of my life. She's all jealous because when she was in Montport, she discovered that the premier davidson he okay he has a husband and he's allowed to have a husband because there okay marriage is not about these like alliance connections and just making heirs and she's kind of like ah oh, the freedom i wish i had that she's all plotting plotting still so she just casually leads mary to this little secret entrance to cal's bedroom and is like mm, if you want so she does and then they, they get back together but they're like nothing has changed we're just here doing it they send a note to Maven being like, let's talk, let's parley. And then Maven sends back and he goes, bye. So they decide to meet at dawn at this island that's neutral ground. And they discover that Maven has set up like a silent stone circle. We know how much he loves that silent stone. And so they're kind of like mm, mad about that because that's not usually journal protocol, but they go along with it because like, you know, they want to have this. And they know that he's not going to negotiate, but Cal is very like, I need to see it for myself that the brother I know has been lost and isn't coming back kind of thing. Because up until now, he's like, maybe if we find a new blood who has like the equivalent to a whisper power, then they can like fix his brain. So they get there and they're like, have their little quabble quabble. Cal's like, surrender Maven and you won't die. And Maven's like, <coughs> no. And then he's like, surrender because I'm gonna win. And they're like, mm, no. So then everybody's like, okay, cool, guess we're gonna leave now because that really went nowhere. And then as they're leaving, they're like, mm, what's happening over there? It feels like the island is flooding a bit. Are we about to be attacked? But no, what actually happened, okay, is that the Piedmont and the Lake Lander people who were on Maven's side, they have turned on him. They have killed his sentinels. They have captured him and they bring him over and they're like, uh, we are ready for our trade. And everybody is like, trade? What trade? Cal's like, I didn't hear of any trade. But what we discovered in an earlier Irish chapter is that while she was just, you know, hanging out one day, she gets into her little transport, which is basically a car. And inside is Annabelle and Julian. And they're like, look, what if we could give you that Eral guy who murdered your dad. And she's like, as much as I like that, that's not really much. And they're like, what if we also gave you 
Volo Samos, the king of the rip, Evangeline's dad. He's the real reason that your dad's dead. And she's like, I am listening. So they had made this decision to trade Maven for the e guy and Samos. The e guy is given over and they're like murdering him while Maven's being handed over. Everybody's all like real aqua taco about it. They're like, hmm. But Evangeline's like, this can't be enough. This is not enough. What else would they possibly give? And she goes, oh, my father. And she feels really like conflicted about this because she's like, mm, if my father is given over and he's dead, then the rift is no longer a kingdom and it falls apart and then Cal's not gonna wanna marry me and then I don't have to marry anybody and I can just do what I want. But also, then my dad would be dead. Oof. Where I left off is that they now have like brought Maven back to the to Harbor Bay from this trade. The Volo Samos trade thing hasn't happened yet. He's not there yet. He was like over in the rift, not attacking Harbor Bay because he's like, mm, I don't want to die. They like bring him back and then Farley's all like, eh, look at this prince. But we won a victory and everybody's like, wow. And then Mare is like, I really feel icky about this. I don't want anybody paraded like I was paraded when I was a captured person, even if it's Maven. And Cal's kind of feeling the same way again. So they're like, mm, rush him out of here. We don't want him on, on the show. I don't want to be like him. And so now I guess people are going to have to make some decisions because now Mare and Cal are like, mm, we thought we were going to have a bit longer to figure things out but like the war feels ended but it's nowhere near ended so like what are we gonna do what are we gonna do that's how how things are going so i'm liking it i'm liking it. i feel like the pacing has like settled into a way where things are really still fast but they're not like too fast if there's not like anything that's like super boring and nothing has happened but like there's a nice little wave of events happening i feel like the povs are working a lot better they're more even. I actually care about the people that we're getting the POVs from and each POV is actually providing us information that we could not get from the other ones. I feel like Miss Victoria Aviard has figured some things out when she was writing this book. I'd also like to say in the terms of the queer rep that I was talking about in the previous book, I had to talk to my best friend about this because she is part of the queer community and I really wanted her perspective because I was like, I don't really feel like I can really talk on this as a cishet woman, you know? I feel like that's not really my place. But I talked to her about it because I was like, I'm feeling a little uncomfortable about, especially the Maven one. I feel like Evangeline has been developed in a way that it actually has worked fully into her character, her identity and what it means and also into her storyline, her plotline is there, but it's not the only thing about her plotline, if that makes sense. So I felt better about that. The Megan one, I think it mostly made me feel icky because it was like basically told to us by Mayor based off of like one sentence he said that was not clear. So it felt really weird to have like another character place that label on him. In his POV, we do discover that he does actually say in his own mind that he did love Thomas. So I guess that is a personal statement basically of his bisexuality. But I still feel like it's a label that was just like slapped on him and not actually part of his character from the start. I don't know, maybe all of these ideas were in place from the beginning of book one, but the way that it's written, it feels like we got to book three and the author was like, mm, I feel like I should put some rep in this because I'm now, you know, discovering that that's important, which is like, good i'm glad she wants to put the rep in i just feel like could have been done better especially in the case of maven i feel like it just doesn't it's just not sitting right with me and my friend was telling me from what i was explaining to her of like the book and the plot and the characters and how it's written in she was feeling the same way that it doesn't really feel genuine to the character and that's kind of the main issue along especially within the third book it being placed on him by another character without any confirmation i guess that's what i have to say for now i'm going to be finishing the book today because yet again i am racing the clock of my livy little loan so that has to go back this afternoon so wish me luck i'm reading like 200 pages this morning woo woo see you when i finish the book also the best part of this book there's not been a single mention of school baby not a single one. We love it. We feel blessed. Thank you. Thank you. We have done the deed. We have finished the job. We have completed the journey. 
I actually finished War Storm like two days ago, like the same day as the last update. I actually finished it that day, but then I got I got a little busy. I had a little too much on the plate. So here we are now, and I shall tell you about the last bit of the last book of the Red Queen series. What happened at the end? How did it finish? You must just be dying to know, unless you read the whole series already and now you're just watching this video for what reason. So where we left off, they had just captured Maven and they had brought him back to Harbor Bay because now he is a prisoner. Maven is now a prisoner and they bring him to the like now designated throne room in Harbor Bay so that they can decide his fate. And Cal is sitting there, Premier Davidson from Montfort, and I guess now King Samos is there, and Marley is there, and Julian and Annabelle is there, and then Mare is there, but she's not like in a fancy chair, okay? She's just like, she's just present at, I was gonna say ceremony, it is not a ceremony, <laughs> at this meeting. And then Maven is there, the Lakelander princess and queen, they took his little flame bracelet, so he got... He got no flame, he got no spark. He's just hanging out, being captured. And Cal is like, Premier Davidson, what would the punishment be for treason in Montfort? And they asked the same thing for like, what would you do to like Lord King, Samos, and Farley? And everybody says, mm, execution, he should die. And Cal is like, I agree. Maven, you're gonna be sentenced to death. And Maven is like, mm. can I just like ask like one thing though? Can I pretty pretty please ask a little a little favor? And Cal is like, I mean you can ask, doesn't mean I'm gonna say yeah. And Maven's like, can you bury me with my mum? Everybody's like, that's a little weird. Which I'm like, why is that a little bit weird? I feel like it's normal to want them buried with your family. Now, if it, if they were interpreting this that like he wanted to be buried like on top of his mom, that's gonna be a little weird. That's gonna be a little Heathcliff from Wuthering Heights. Why am I talking about a Bronte sister classic in this <laughs> in this vlog? Everybody's like, that's a little weird, but okay, sure. And then Maven is like, also, also, what is up with these people demanding things when they're in no place to be demanding things? He goes, also. I want to die the same way as my mom. And then everybody's looking at Mare. Because Mare, right, right, she's the one who killed Alara with the big old electrical shock, huge lightning strike, patel. And to answer that, Mare goes, mm, no, Maven, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to kill you. And Maven's like kind of sad. And you're like, wow, Maven, you're, you're a weird one. And Cal's like, mm, it'll be It'll be quick. I haven't decided what it's gonna be yet, but it'll be quick. And it's like, take him away. Take him away. So Maven's, Maven's gone. Then what happens? Shock, 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 shock. It's not that much of a shock. So Farley, Montfort, Premier Davidson, and then Mayor. They tell Cal, they're like, look, we've been allying with you because Maven's been a nasty boy, but we don't want a king. So, step down from the throne and give up the whole king thing or like all of us and all of our funds and our people see the door we're gonna be walking out of it and cal is like i'm gonna be a good king i was made to be king and i'm gonna be i'm gonna be such a good king i'm gonna i'm gonna king the heck out of being king and they're like mm, okay guess we're gone then but can you at least like i don't know like end slavery and conscription maybe consider that and cal goes you know what i'm gonna give every red the choice to work and fair wages and conscription is done as of like this second reds are gonna be treated good in this country and they're like hmm, well at least there's that and then they leave and the mayor's like hold on guys before we like teleport out of here to montfort i need to visit somebody we all know it's maven so she goes to visit maven and he's like not in the cell he's in a room just like when she was not in the cell but in a room Wow. And so she goes to like chat with Maven to be like, mm, you know what, Maven, you really, you really screwed up. Okay. Cal still loved you. Like he, he was trying, he was trying as she's there, Farley and the premier come in and they have teleported with them and they're like, we gotta go. And she's like, we, and they're like, mm, yeah. And they grab her and Maven and they, boop, 
they pop out of there and then they're in Montford and they have taken Maven to Montford. They have stolen the prisoner. Garlic guard. Betrayal. Oh. So now Maven is not dead and he's not a prisoner of cows. He's he's over in Montford. And Maven's like, hmm, look at me in Montford. But then he's put in a he's put in a little cell of silent stone underground with no windows. <laughs> kinda sucks. Kinda nasty. So over back in Harbor Bay, right, 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 they have like found out that Maven is gone and they're like, Maven is gone? Like he's got like he left. He escaped and they're like, no. Montfort and Scarlet Guard took him and they're like, oh, this is not good because if Maven is still alive and there's gonna be people in Nordica who still thinks he should be the king and are not gonna they're not gonna come and like swear their devotion to Cal. This is a disaster. This is like a big problem. But little Annabelle is like, look, Cal, okay, this is what's gonna happen. We're moving ahead with the plan. We're going to go to the capital and we're gonna have a coronation so you can be named king in the capital and then you'll marry Evangeline and you'll have a queen and it'll be fine and it's gonna be delightful. And then Cal's like, kick, 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 kick. I'm not panicking at all, this is totally fine. I'm also not heartbroken because Mary left, even though I know she would leave because this has been like the one thing that's been ripping apart our relationship the whole time anyway. And then Evangeline is like, um, Cal, can I have like um can I have a moment? Like just the two of us? Can we can we have a little a little chat? And he's like, Evangeline wants to talk to me? What the heck? And Evangeline is like, look, I'm about to tell you something, and you cannot tell anybody anybody at all not a single one and he's like okay go for it and then Angelina's is like do you honestly think that the lakelanders would have taken the row and given us maven and nothing else and he's like yeah you got a point and she's like i think that they also are going to be getting my dad and cal is like damn and she's like yeah and look, I'm not doing anything about that information. So Evangeline has decided to do nothing. So as a result, it's like, she's not deciding to kill her dad, but she's also not deciding to save him. She's just not dropping that information to be to be had. And Cal is like, I mean, that's, that's her decision. Like, I'm not going to tell anybody. So that's fine. That's like a big moment because she's all been very devoted to the family before this. So she goes back up to her room because Elaine is here now. Because Elaine came with her parents. She like goes have a nap because she's like, it's been a long day. Like I almost died this morning. And in the bed, there's a note and it's from Premier Davison who's like, look, you can come and live in Montfort with Elaine. Just order tea to your room and we'll come get you. And Elaine's like, what are you gonna do? Because Elaine, she saw the note and she read the note and she's like, what are you gonna do? Because I, I can't live like this much longer. I can't do it. And Evangeline is like, I can't, I can't betray and leave my family. So she doesn't order the tea. Tear, sad. So Mare's in Montfort and she's like, wow, I really hate that Maven is in Montfort right now because I really don't want to deal with him. So she's like, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna climb up a mountain. So she climbs up a mountain. And on the top of the mountain, you know what she finds? John, creepy new blood guy with the red eyes, okay, who sees the future, he's at the top of the mountain, and he's like, oh, hey, and Mary's like, John, I hate you, and John's like, look, the Lakelands are planning to attack the capital, Archeon, and if you let them win that, they'll rule Nordica for a hundred years, and your whole plan of freeing reds in Nordica is, is not going to happen anytime soon and they're going to attack there in a few weeks. No exact date. And there's like, damn. So she goes to all of the people that had, she finally meets all of the command people from the Scarlet Guard. There's like four or five of them or something. They all have like code names, whatever. So they're there and the premier's there along with some other like high council people and she's like, look, I was talking to John, and Farley's like, John, that bitch? And she's like, yeah, this is what I said. And she tells him what I said. And they're like, damn, we're gonna have 
to go save North, aren't we? Because it's true, the Lakelanders, they are going to attack the capital because we were with Iris for a little bit and Iris was like, hey mom, we should like take over Norta and like then you can be like an empress instead of just a queen. And her mom's like, oh, that's a great idea. Let's like get our whole military together because they're gonna be really weak because we have stolen some of the Norta high houses that were with Maven. Like they're now willing to ally themselves with the Lakelands instead of with Cal. So, ooh, that's rough. And Cal now doesn't have like any soldiers really because the Scarlet Guard and Montfort are now like mm, bye. So the Lakelands are like this is the time to invade. Now everybody is like going to the capital, right? Because Cal's going to the capital and the Lakelands are going to attack the capital and Montfort knows that the Lakelands are going to attack the capital so they're now like damn we have to go to the capital. And so in order for the Scarlet Guard and Montfort to sneak their way into the capital they need to know about the tunnels and you know who knows about the tunnels? Maven. So they have to convince Maven to like let them know about all this information and the only way they could get to do this is if he, they bring him with them for some reason and they agree so they're like oh, fine we'll bring you with us they get to the to the capital for some reason they manage to nail it perfectly they get there the exact same day as the lake lands it's magic the lake lands are attacking Evangeline is like the Lakelands are attacking. This is after the coronation. There's a whole scene where there's a coronation and Julian's like, did you read the diary, your mom's diary yet? And Cal's like, I can't bring myself to do it. It hurts too much. And Julian's like, hmm, feel like you should. And so Cal does, like after he's co the coronation, he does, and he's king. So once he's actually king, he goes and he reads his mom's diary. And basically she has this whole thing where she's like, I'm not going to raise my son to be a general and the military and like he's going to be different, he's going to bring peace, he's going to be good and Cal's like, I did not do any of those things my mom wanted. Oh damn, my mom wanted more for me than this, than what I am right now. Everything I thought I was being raised to be is not what she wanted, it's just what my dad wanted. So he's like feeling conflicted and then the Lakelands attack so he's like, get the troops together and what? Evangeline finds out, she's like, mm, my parents are gonna be, you're, you're gonna run away from this, aren't you? You're gonna, you're gonna desert again and go back to the rift and save your own asses, aren't you? And so she has this big moment where she's like, look, Tolly, I've made my decision. Okay, Elaine has been sent away. I'm not gonna tell you where so you don't have to betray me and lie. But Evangeline basically, she like goes to her parents, she's like, I'm leaving. And then her parents attack her. Rude. So she's like, oh my god, what the heck? And then Ptolemy's like attacks her parents because her parents are attacking them. And then the two of them run away. And then Cal is like, are you running away? Evangeline's like, yeah. And Cal is like, okay. Make your own decisions, Evangeline. Choose your own path in life for once. They run away and you know what they do? They take Maven's train. They do, because Maven... Maven loves his training, he has a train now, right? So in the tunnels, all the Scarlet Guard people, they're showing up in the tunnels because Maven's leading them. And Maven's all like, mm -hmm -hmm. what I'm gonna do is I'm going to find an opportune moment to run away and then I can hop on my train and escape. And then literally like while he's thinking this, do you know what happens? The train goes by and then Maven goes, how am I supposed to get away now? That was my plan. They get out of the tunnels, they get there and it's like, oh my God, things are, the lake lands are attacking from the water. They are, the, the water is rising heavily. It's not looking good. Maven finds a moment, he like ends up running away and they're like, oh damn, we lost him. Oh no. So the like war is happening. They find Cal and they're like radioing him and Cal is like, Mare, is it too late? And she's like, no, it's not. It's not too late for anything. So Cal has now, like, in the middle of the battle, he's given up his little kingdom and his kingship to be with Mare and to make a better world because he's like, I hope my mom would have wanted me to do this, you know, to be good, to be better. So then they're fighting and they're on the bridge and then the bridge collapsed and you're like, oh my god, is everybody gonna die? But no, because the teleporter comes and teleports them out of there, so it's fine. And then the Scarlet Guard is like, we're fighting, we're fighting, woo woo woo. Mayor goes, Cal, look, you, you figure stuff out here. Maven ran away, so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go find Maven. Okay, bye.
So what happens in the main fighting area is that the Scarlet Guard, they have submarines, remember? Remember from book two when they're on a submarine? They got a bunch of submarines now. So they bring out the submarine to like attack the ships because nothing else has been able to attack the ships because the queens, they're such good nymphs. I'm also now realizing nymph is also something that's not in the lore of the book yet is used. I, I somehow didn't notice before, but yes. Nymph also doesn't make sense the same way as Banshee. Anyway, they are really strong with the little water powers, and so nobody's been able to attack them, but then they have submarines, and the submarines attack them, and then they retreat because they're like, mm, we're gonna lose, so that's over. Then Maven, okay, Maven is running through all these little tunnels, right? He's trying to find secret passages so he can escape the scape, but all the tunnels are flooded because of the Lakelanders who were flooding everything. So he's like, oh damn, what am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? What am I gonna do? And then Mare finds him and he's like, Maven. And Maven's like, Eek. all I got is this letter opener that I got from the study while I was running through secret passageways. And so Mare follows him and he ends up in the behind the throne room where he had this room of silent stone made. So he's in the silent stone room and then Mare actually goes into the silent stone room which is like a big moment for her because after her whole captured thing any kind of silencing was like very triggering and traumatic for her it makes sense but she you know she goes in there anyway because of maven and then maven attacks her almost kills her with said letter opener and then mare you know she's fighting back she like somehow gets the letter opener and then she like stabs him but she like doesn't know where or like what happens because she blacks out because he's like choking her out you know so then she like wakes up and she's like being healed and she's like what happened and killorn's like maven's dead and mayor's like Ooh, okay and then like cal comes in and cal's like i don't blame you you were it was self-defense because you were dying but also like he still kind of hates a little bit that she killed his brother even though like because you know like that that was a bond that cal just couldn't break so anyway, like the book ends with Norita is just like gonna be a democracy now, I guess. We really don't get to see that happening, but it's like, oh, the Scarlet Guard and Malford is gonna help Norita make a democracy like Malford. And Cal stays and Mare leaves to go because she's like, we need time. And then the end is just her in Montfort with her family. She's reunited and she's like, I miss Cal. I, I love Cal. We'll see each other again. And that's how it ends. Nice ending. I kind of like that they didn't end with Mare and Cal being like together and happy and like, I don't know, like ruling Norta in a democracy or like escaping Norta and living in Montfort. Like I, I like that they were like, no, we need time to heal from everything. But it was like, oh, we'll get back together eventually. I gave this book 4.25 stars. I, like I said, like this was a good book. I felt like so many of the things I was having problems with in the other books were like fixed in this one and I really enjoyed it like the whole time. I did feel a little bit like the end, the tides turned on that final battle a, a little quickly. They were like, oh, they retreated. So we're fine. We won. Not enough mm, to that for me. I kind of was hoping for a bit more. That's fine, I guess. I was kind of expecting a bit of like a jump forward to Norita no longer being a mar monarchy and I don't know, maybe Cal being part of the council or whatever and didn't really get any of that. Oh, I forgot to mention that like Julian and Annabelle literally like did a little singing thing to Lord Samos, forced him to like run full fledged in this jump onto the ship that Iris and her mother was on. So, and then he was dead. He like splattered onto it, you know, because he jumped off a cliff. And they're like, we've received all of our payment. That was the end of Lord Samos, he's dead. Evangeline and Ptolemus and Elaine are in Montfort living their, their lives. People are just happy in Montfort, that, that was the end. I was content with it. I wasn't like overly disappointed. I kind of wished for a little bit more, but it did the job, it did the deed. So I was happy, pretty good. Can't do too much complaining about the end. I did a lot of complaining on the way here, so I guess I ran out at this point. I guess now I need to do like an outro because this is actually the end of, of the vlog. This is the end. We made it. 
So if you happen to actually make it this far, please give this a like. Even if you didn't like it, just give it a like because I put so much effort into this video. <laughs> you guys know how often I say like and um and so and you know. There's a lot of things I've been cutting out so you guys don't have to suffer the way I suffer. Let me know if you read the Red Queen series, what your thoughts are on it, or you know, any other comments you might have. Please feel free to leave them all below. Have a little conversation with me, please, and thank you about the series. Let me know if there's another series that you think I should read and do this type of video with as well. Why not? If you're also still around, clearly you like me enough to be here for three hours, so why don't you subscribe, stay for a little longer. I'm really marketing myself amazingly right now. I appreciate you watching my feature length film. There may be another one in the future. Not all of my videos are this long, so check out some of my shorter ones where I make just normal sit down book to videos and not these monstrosities. I hope you're having an amazing day. I hope you continue to have an amazing day. And I hope to see you again in the next one. Mwah. Bye!